Good afternoon and um, welcome to this seminar about bioeconomy and especially with a European dimension. How to cooperate, how to develop bioeconomy in Europe. I am especially glad to have the honor to welcome the Minister of Economic Affairs in Finland, Olli Rehn, and uh, also the political advisor, Therese Knapp, from Sweden, representing the Swedish Minister of Energy, Ibrahim Bailan. Just to explain to all of you who are not Swedish, in Sweden we have had for more than 30 years an ongoing battle, 35 years, 40 years, an ongoing battle about our nuclear plants. And we have also had a referendum to close them down. And we decided to do so. 2010 was the last year they should run. Now it is 2016 and they are still up, running and producing electricity without carbon footprint. So in a way it is uh, a, a good production. But it has created long political tensions in Sweden. And just now, there is a commission representing all political parties in Sweden, the main political parties, who are trying to find a compromise how to go on with the energy supply in Sweden. Because it's a necessity for a developed industrial country to have a secure and also an environmentally friendly supply of energy for a foreseeable future. Hopefully they will reach an agreement this week, delayed, I must say, but hopefully. If that's the case, that will explain why not the minister himself is present today. That is the reason. But we are glad to welcome Madame Knapp, and we are looking forward to hear her intervention, from the, her intervention in this discussion. As you all are aware, the Paris summit decided or gave the recommendation to use our forests to combat climate change. That is extremely important. But to be honest, there are not always a popular support to do so. People love wood products, but they don't like cutting trees. And I think they will also be firm supporters of bioeconomy. But there will be a resistance against using the raw material from the forests. We have, when we are discussing how to develop bioeconomy, we have also to focus upon that dimension. We have to have a popular support for using our forests. We have to have a good narrative, how to plant, how to thin, how to cut, how to take it into industry, how to produce new things that can replace products based upon oil and in such a way combat climate change. The whole narrative, not only the bioeconomic narrative, the whole narrative started in the forests. I am myself a forest owner, and I am a forester. Hands on. I love that life. I'm living my dream, so to say. After having been a prime minister for very, very many years, I started as a farmer with meat production and forestry. It's a very good life. But I can see one thing, and that is, it's not especially economic successful to be a forest owner today. It is not. Everyone is talking about forest as a resource, a raw material for the new industrial revolution. Everyone. Welcome. But we need also to see a link to the production 
and we are extremely successful in the Nordic countries with our forestry. We are extremely successful. But we don't always have the popular support to use our raw material. This is not only a problem, it is a challenge. Because if we can't solve that, others will take the lead to develop bioeconomy. Because this is not a European invention. This is research and science, and that is truly international. If we hesitate to do it, others will do it. And if we hesitate to do it, economists like the Finnish and the Swedish will be heavily hurted. We need to be in the forefront. We need to take the lead. We need to have an open intellectual discussion about how to use our forests and to give the best narrative how to use it in such a way so we can combat climate change. This is a part of the reason why we are meeting here today in Helsinki. The other part of the reason is, we all know, Finland is going through a hard period. Hopefully it has turned around. But despite that, Finland is one of the countries in Europe taking the lead in the bioeconomic development. Together with Germany, and we have all reason to salute the Finnish government doing so. Now we also have reason to remember that in Finland you have one of the most important European institutions when it comes to forestry and forest industry. And it is the European Forest Institute in UN Zoo, supported heavily by the Finnish government in difficult times and thank you for that, but also attracting researchers and scientists to Finland, also giving the domestic debate an input that an international organization can do. It's truly European, but it is anchored in Finland. Therefore, we are meeting here today in Helsinki, and I wish you once more warmly welcome and we are looking forward to your interventions, and we are looking forward to the summary that my co-chair, Mr. Esko Ahu, will do in the end of the conference. And that will also be published together with uh, our signatures in international media. So therefore, once more, welcome, and I now give the floor to uh, the director of EFI, Mark Falai, please. Thank you, dear chairs, Minister Ren, distinguished participants, excellencies. Terve Tulwa, welcome to Think Forest. As probably most of you know, Think Forest events are usually happening in, uh, in Brussels at the European Parliament because one of our main goals was to build a better understanding on forest-related questions by European policymakers and, and politicians. But as Mr. Parson mentioned, right now there are very good reasons why we want to host this uh, event on the future of the bioeconomy here in Helsinki. I would like to add to the thanks by, by Mr. Parson to the Finnish government for the confirmation of the financial reinforced support that the the Finnish government will provide to, to the European Forest Institute. And especially one of the reasons why this new support is coming is because the Finnish government, together with other governments, expect EFI to play a, a more prominent and visible European role in fostering a science-informed dialogue on the future of the bioeconomy. So thank you again for, to the Finnish government. Since yesterday we had a very inspiring dinner uh, with the two chairs and, and many of the speakers. I wanted just to, to finish my intervention before going to the seminar with a, a, a general reflection that is inspired from the dinner yesterday. And you can correct me if I, I didn't capture well. But uh, I think every several hundred years, our societies suffer a paradigmatic transformation. Society reorganizes itself within a few decades, 
due to intellectual, economic, or social developments, and then it puts the basis for a totally new era. This happened in the 13th century when the center of gravity moved to the cities. It happened in the 15th century with the emergence of Renaissance, the invention of the printing machine, the Protestant reform. And maybe I would be quite right if I said that the last really paradigmatic transformation took place a bit more than 200 years ago. In those days, uh, uh, an Anglican clerical, uh, Robert Malthus, wrote his essay on the principle of population, where basically he was arguing that the exponential population growth of, of Western Europe could not be matched by a similar increase of land productivity. He was quite right. Mm -hmm. What probably he didn't know is that just a few kilometers from where he was writing his essay, there was another person, a Scottish man called uh, James Watt, who had, in those same days, invented the steam engine. The steam engine triggered an industrial and agricultural revolution without precedence. Within years, production moved from the workshops to the factories. That was the beginning of capitalism, because you needed a really new level, a scale of investment to run factories. So capitalism started. A new class was developed, the workers. Patents, the concept of patents were developed. The first engineering schools started. So the concern by Malthus was very much answered by the power of science, the power of technology. <clears throat> In a few decades, the population of England multiplied by four. That's true. That was to be expected. But the national product multiplied by 14 times. So you can see how, how the challenge was faced by, by new technology. And I think now, after more than 200 years of an industrial area, we have seen, we have been able to deliver growth and prosperity in many parts of the world. But also, we have created probably the largest environmental externality of our history, which is climate change. And, it, and if you look at nowadays the, the challenges we are facing, we are in, ma in many ways they are very similar to the challenges we were facing more than 200 years ago: overpopulation in some areas, a scarcity of resources social unrest in many places. So in, in a way, very similar. The big difference is the scale. Now we are talking about billions. In those days, it was millions. It's a global scale. On the top of it, we have the problem of climate change and a structural problem, and we will need to deal with that. So I really believe that within the next decades, we are going to experience a similar paradigmatic transformation as we experienced 200 years ago. The computer is the steam engine of our times. Advances in robotics and technology and science are faster than ever. So in the coming years, we will need to force a paradigmatic transformation. Basically, we need to learn to deliver growth within the renewable boundaries of our planet. It's as simple and as difficult as that. Growth needs to be based on the power of nature. So we need to move from an inertia of 200 years of a linear fossil-based economy towards a circular bio-based economy. It's not going to be easy. The term fossil also means resistant to change. Fossil means resistant to change. So it's going to be difficult. But remember that bio means life. And there is no more powerful driver for change than life. So with that reflection, I want to finish my intervention and, and really wishing a, a very fruitful uh, conference today. Thank you very much. Oli Rehn to take the podium. Oli, before you start, you have to tell us, are you a forester as well? So what is your ownership today? With, uh, with pleasure, Esko. Thank you. Prime Ministers, uh, Excellencies, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, uh, dear friends of uh, forests, uh, it's uh, indeed uh, a great pleasure for me to be here today with you and uh, to share some thoughts on the bioeconomy, especially forest-based uh, bioeconomy. As uh, Esko was uh, requesting, and I have to make uh, a, a revelation here, I'm, I'm also a, a forest owner 
in my summer cottage, uh, we have uh, a plantation of uh, real latifundia, plantation of uh, 3,300 uh, square meters, uh, which is uh, slightly less than, uh, less than uh, half a hectare. So uh, with uh, our daughter, we have uh, christened that uh, some uh, 17 years ago already as the, the forest of uh, half a hectare, which is uh, known to everybody from uh, the volumes of uh, Winnie the Pooh, who had uh, such, a, such a forest. I can't uh, claim that I would be a, a major industrial producer, nevertheless, but uh, it, is my same, it is my hobby as well, as uh, Jöran said, uh, to uh, spend a big part of uh, my summer doing some forestry work even in this uh, small forest. So, uh, dear friends, uh, let me thank the European Forest Institute uh, for organizing this uh, forum and uh, Prime Minister Esko Aho and uh, Jöran Persson for the very valuable and uh, important uh, contribution. Uh, today I will focus on the role of uh, forest-based uh, bio bioeconomy in Finland uh, and Europe uh, and uh, on uh, what might be the role of uh, the European Forest uh, uh, Institute. In fact, uh, I'm very glad to have uh, Theresa Knapp uh, here with my, as my colleague uh, to speak uh, today. And uh, to Jörn, I can say that uh, I fully understand that uh, Ibrahim has to be in, uh, in Sweden in these uh, very important uh, negotiations uh, on the direction of uh, energy policy of, uh, of Sweden, especially with the background that uh, Esko and uh, myself, uh, we used to be good uh, pals of uh, Thurbjör Feldin uh, at the time when he was uh, fighting for sustain sustainable ecological development uh, also in the field of uh, energy policy. So now it is the task of uh, Ibrahim uh, to deal with uh, the political fallout of uh, all the activism and campaigns uh, we had uh, at some point against uh, nuclear power. So I wish uh, Ibrahim and uh, his colleagues uh, the best of uh, success uh, in this uh, climate-wise and uh, energy-wise uh, very important uh, endeavor, which, by the way, also has importance for Finland because we are all part of the common Nordic uh, electricity market. As regards uh, the bioeconomy, there are four unquestionable priorities uh, of, uh, or preferential properties of uh, biological resources uh, to be kept in mind. Uh, first is uh, renewability. Second is uh, CO2 friendliness. Uh, third is uh, uh, the potential for re- and uh, multi-use uh, formats. Uh, and uh, fourth, uh, the new functions and uh, features uh, such as uh, longer lifetime, higher durability, strength and uh, density, and uh, reduced uh, toxicity. The bioeconomy should not be perceived uh, only as, uh, or the, as the only way to save uh, the planet, uh, but uh, rather as uh, one essential element uh, in uh, finding sustainable solutions uh, to the major contemporary challenges uh, we face uh, globally. At the global level, and that's something that uh, always uh, strikes me when I recall this fact, uh, it is uh, estimated that uh, by 2030, that's uh, in less than 15 years, uh, we will need 50% uh, uh, more food, 45% uh, uh, more energy, and 30% uh, uh, more water than, uh, than today. Thus, uh, the bioeconomy is uh, no silver bullet, uh, but uh, it is uh, still uh, of uh, great value in those cases uh, where biological resources uh, are physically available in uh, abundance, uh, like forests uh, in the northern European countries, uh, such as uh, Sweden and Finland, uh, or where uh, avail available with uh, the help of uh, smart uh, technologies uh, like uh, biotechnology. And here one can say that uh, we are on the edge of uh, a new economic uh, era. In, in Finland, uh, we are convinced that uh, a important, uh, very important uh, next wave in the development of the global economy is uh, bioeconomy. 
With this, uh, we refer to, the, to an economy that uh, relies on the sustainable use of uh, renewable natural resources uh, to produce uh, materials, uh, energy, products uh, and uh, services. Uh, it will reduce uh, our dependence uh, on uh, fossil resources, uh, prevent uh, losses of uh, biodiversity, and uh, help uh, creating new and uh, sustainable economic uh, uh, growth. Bioeconomy is uh, a strong instrument uh, in uh, solving global problems uh, caused by the rapid uh, population growth, uh, followed by an increased uh, demand on uh, food, uh, feed, uh, energy, and uh, raw materials. Bioeconomy has also an important uh, interface uh, with uh, the circular uh, economy. Concerning Finland, uh, Finland is a country with uh, substantial forest resources uh, and uh, significant uh, knowledge uh, in this uh, field. Throughout uh, centuries, uh, forests uh, have uh, provided uh, food, uh, fuel, shelter and uh, source of uh, livelihood, uh, as well as uh, opportunities uh, for economic uh, development uh, for our people. The sustainable management of forests uh, is indeed uh, vital for the Finnish people, as uh, forests uh, provide uh, numerous and uh, significant, uh, I would call them, uh, ecosystem services uh, to everybody in this uh, country. And I, I will also try to prove Jöran wrong in a sense that uh, forestry can also be economically profitable and uh, sustainable in uh, the North Nordic uh, countries. The volume of uh, wood in Finnish forests uh, increases uh, every year. And this is something that I want to underline to, say, uh, those who come from the uh, rest of Europe, because this is not always uh, uh, well known or well understood, uh, or come from the rest of the world. Some figures, uh, the total volume of uh, wood in Finnish forests uh, was almost uh, 2.4 billion cubic meters uh, last year, 2015, so 2.4 billion cubic meters. The annual growth uh, of uh, Finnish forests uh, has, uh, for a few years, uh, already exceeded uh, 100 uh, million cubic meters. Annual felling has, uh, for a long time, been significantly smaller than annual growth uh, of uh, forests. So you can see that it is uh, sustainable also in the light of uh, these uh, uh, figures. At the same time, uh, Finland has uh, strong know-how in forestry, forest industries, uh, technology, construction, energy, chemistry, food and health sciences. Innovation, as well as uh, cooperation and combined uh, technologies uh, in these fields uh, make Finland uh, a real forerunner in the field of uh, bioeconomy. The bioeconomy is uh, indeed, uh, therefore, a great opportunity for countries like uh, Finland and Sweden, and I would also say countries like the Baltic, uh, Baltic states, uh, where there is a uh, strong abundance of uh, forestry resor resources. Two years ago, Finland launched uh, an ambitious uh, program on the bioeconomy, its uh, objective is to create uh, 100,000 uh, new jobs uh, and uh, to increase uh, the turnover of uh, bioeconomy from 60 to 100 billion euros by the year 2025. And this, was, uh, this uh, program was prepared uh, in cooperation with uh, all stakeholders uh, in the country, which is uh, the Nordic Scandinavian way of uh, preparing key policies. The Finnish government uh, has recognized uh, bioeconomy and uh, clean tech uh, as uh, spearheads, as, uh, as key economic uh, priorities uh, in the government program. Altogether, 300 million euros uh, will be allocated uh, extra to activities uh, leading to new business models uh, and uh, larger share of uh, bioenergy in the next uh, three years as part of the government uh, program. One uh, key objective uh, 
is to increase uh, the use of uh, wood uh, by 15 million cubic meters uh, annually and to generate uh, new innovative uh, wood-based uh, products and services. What could they be? Hundreds of uh, different kind of uh, bio-based uh, products uh, have been brought to the market uh, recently or are being developed uh, by the forest industry but also by the chemical industry, the agro-food industry, and uh, by the energy and uh, construction sectors. These uh, products and services uh, include uh, various kinds of uh, transport fuels, uh, bio-oil and uh, biogas, uh, dissolving pulp, uh, microfibrillated uh, cellulose, uh, wood composites, uh, and uh, construction materials. I'm sure that uh, there are, in the course of uh, today's discussions, uh, better engineers uh, than, than myself uh, to explain uh, more, in more concrete terms what you can do of this, uh, but just to illustrate uh, the possibilities uh, that uh, are included uh, in uh, the bioeconomy and uh, relevant uh, uh, industries, uh, products and uh, services. Dear friends, uh, in Finland, uh, investment uh, in the forest industry has, uh, after a long period of, uh, of a decline, has started recently to grow. And uh, the total value of uh, ongoing and uh, planned uh, projects uh, is uh, estimated uh, to be at least uh, 3 billion euro, above 3 billion euros. The interesting thing is that uh, while we had, uh, unfortunately, we had uh, a fairly long but slow decline of, uh, of uh, especially paper industry because of uh, many factors, uh, not least uh, the fact that uh, digitalization is, uh, is proceeding and uh, there is uh, less need of uh, newspaper and uh, uh, fine print uh, uh, products. Uh, at the same time, uh, in more recent years, uh, we have seen uh, the recovery of uh, pulp industry and uh, while speaking under the control of, uh, of uh, for instance, Mr. Jatinen from the Federation of Forest Industries uh, and uh, Professor Ollikainen, who are the real experts in this field, uh, I can say that uh, there have been two factors which have uh, saved uh, or are saving uh, uh, the Finnish uh, forestry industry, only slightly ex exaggerating. Uh, one is uh, Amazon.com because of the need uh, to have uh, packaging material in the world of uh, digitalization. And the other one is uh, the Chinese consumer who demands uh, soft paper, which uh, is another source of, uh, of uh, demand uh, for uh, pulp industry. But it's not uh, the old-fashioned uh, pulp industry, which was uh, very polluting and uh, using plenty of uh, electricity. It is a very different kind of uh, pulp industry. And in fact, uh, when pulp factories are produced uh, now in Finland, uh, are constructed in Finland, uh, they are in fact uh, rightly so called uh, bioproduct uh, factories. For instance, uh, Metsafiber is uh, constructing a large uh, bioproduct factory in Äänekoski, central Finland, uh, which is uh, the largest uh, individual industrial investment uh, in the history of uh, Finnish uh, forest uh, industry. In uh, addition to high quality pulp, uh, the mill intends uh, to produce uh, bioenergy and uh, various uh, biomaterials. Uh, One-fifth uh, of the turnover of the Anekoski bioproducts mill uh, will be derived uh, from uh, products uh, other than pulp. The mill site uh, already hosts uh, several other wood processing companies uh, and uh, the number of these uh, is uh, growing. The plant is uh, the first one of its kind uh, in the world uh, to be connected uh, to a, a pulp mill. Metsafiber is uh, actively seeking companies uh, to invest in uh, further processing of its uh, side streams. Uh, and uh, thanks to the raw material availability, reliable operating environment uh, and uh, skilled uh, workforce, uh, Finland uh, is an excellent uh, investment destination for companies uh, to invest uh, in the bioeconomy here. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, in Europe uh, as well, uh, we need uh, a shared goal and approach uh, in the field of uh, bioeconomy. 
our common bioeconomy goal is uh, sustainable growth uh, and sustainable well-being to reduce uh, our dependence on uh, fossil fuel and uh, fossil raw materials uh, and, of course, uh, to combat uh, the climate uh, change. Moreover, the EU's uh, policy for bioenergy sustainability should uh, contribute uh, to the development of uh, bioenergy markets uh, and uh, enable to increase uh, the use of uh, sustainable bioenergy. EU policy on uh, bioenergy sustainability should be developed uh, primarily by utilizing the existing legislative instruments uh, and other policy instruments uh, and uh, thus uh, avoiding uh, excessive administrative burden and respecting the principle of better regulation. The circumstances, of course, vary in EU member states and therefore the strengths in the bioeconomy differ by member state, member state by member state and region by region in Europe. It is essential to work together towards a sustainable, flexible and a competitive uh, European bioeconomy that is uh, widely accepted uh, by our people, by the whole society. The common objective uh, is to develop uh, products and services uh, to the internal market and export markets, uh, which uh, globally pave the way for a more sustainable production and uh, consumption. At the level of the European Union, there are a number of uh, tools available promote uh, the transition towards uh, the bioeconomy, such as uh, the Horizon 2020 research program or the Rural Development program. And I'm sure that uh, the Commission's uh, uh, advisor, Thomas Arnold, uh, and uh, member of the European Parliament, Mia uh, Petra Kumpulanatri, will explain more to you about uh, this uh, in their interventions. In any case, uh, I want to encourage uh, the Commission and uh, other actors uh, to continue the ongoing work uh, and to enhance uh, policy coherence uh, in the field of bioeconomy. Especially, we need to reduce uh, possible regulatory uncertainties, uh, hindering significant uh, bioeconomy investments. We need uh, investment, and that's why we need to have uh, clarity and predictability in uh, the regulatory environment uh, and avoid excessive administrative burden. So, chairpersons, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, finally, what could be the role of uh, the European Forest Institute uh, in the field of uh, bioeconomy? I want to underline that uh, the EFI is an intergovernmental body with its uh, headquarters uh, in Joensuu, Finland, uh, has uh, ambitious uh, plans uh, to become uh, one of the leading bioeconomy knowledge centers uh, and uh, hub in uh, Europe uh, in this uh, important uh, field. We are certainly very committed uh, to this and we are very interested uh, in promoting such uh, development, uh, such uh, evolution of uh, EFI towards a biology, bi bioeconomy knowledge uh, hub for, for Europe. And uh, I want to encourage uh, us all, including uh, the European Commission and uh, member states, uh, to work together and to make even better use of the quality expertise of uh, EFI and its networks uh, also in the field of uh, EU's uh, forest-related uh, bioeconomy. Thank you very much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I wish uh, everybody a very successful seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Rehn, and now we give the floor to Political advisor Therese Knapp from Sweden. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Minister, Mr. Chair, thank you for having me here and thank you for uh, accepting our apologies that Mi Minister Bailen could not attend today. But we have heard two good explanations of why. Um, but I'm happy to be here and share the Swedish um, view on bioeconomy and uh, the importance of forest in the bioeconomy. 
Let me start off with the stance made by the Swedish Prime Minister and the Swedish government. We want Sweden to become one of the world's first fossil-free welfare societies. Fossil-free. It's an ambitious target, but we believe it's possible. When you look at what is happening in the world right now and coming from the debate in Paris in 2015, we also see that the rest of the world feel the same. This is the way forward. But the question is, how can we do this? Well, we need to start looking at the assets we have and manage them sustainably. Forests make out approximately 70% of Sweden. It was the forest that made us rise from poverty to industry. And forest and forest-based value chain are still key to our economy and it makes out approximately 12 well, 15 billion euros worth of exports every year. So forests are simply one of the cornerstones of a bioeconomy. And like all strategic assets, uh, it's enriched by knowledge and considerate management. So we believe that we need to improve both the protection and uh, the environment and consideration of the forest while we can increase the forest production. We think it's both you can do this at the same time. We should also look for synergies and sound markets. If you read the EU bioeconomy strategy, it highlights the importance of research and innovation. It also pinpoints policy interaction. To add to this, we like to emphasize the importance of strategic partnerships between countries, between businesses, between academia and business. It's only when the market, the research and the policy work together, that's when we create the best uh, grounds for creating new products to innovation, to test beds and finally out to the market. Adding to this, we also need to secure long-term policy framework. One of the most vital components for business development and to get investments is security. Market security and policy security. And right now, on both sides, uh, people are asking what role will the forest be able to take? And getting these investments, we're talking about long-term investment horizons, large scale and a very systematic shift. So what we should do is not to limit the use of the wood. Instead, we should open up the market so the entrepreneurs, the innovators, and the buyer economies can develop this and show us the way. As the bioeconomy economy will share or take a major part of the energy transition, I want to spend some minutes also on the energy part of this. Three quarters of today's energy production in the EU makes out of uh, fossil fuels, still. So we have an urgent and a necessary shift to make here, to go from the fossil area into the renewable and sustainable area. And it's all not only for climate objectives, it's also for the security of supply, it's for industrial competitiveness and to create new jobs. And hopefully we can, in the EU, uh, come together on the urgency and the benefits at hand. And find those solutions that are cost efficient, large scale, and able to deliver already today. And forest biomass will be crucial in this process. Um, we would like to share three comments regarding the future EU policy on bioenergy. Firstly, um, jobs, economic growth, secure and sustainable energy systems are all interlinked and should be handled together. So the objective of the future policy must be to support and not limit an increased use of biomass. Secondly, uh, a new EU policy uh, should respect the member states' uh, national uh, policies and competence and make full use of the national competence while combining it with international agreements. 
And lastly, the competitiveness of bioenergy and other, as well as other industry sectors, depends on an open and transparent market. What we need is an open and well-functioning biomass market uh, without any in indirect trade barriers. That will be crucial when we, sh when we see that the market demand will increase. All right. Um, going back to that first stance I opened up with, becoming the world's, one of the world's first fossil-free welfare societies. It's ambitious, yes, but it's possible, especially in the Nordic countries where we have the forest here, and we have very good situation to become this. We see that forest and forestry will be at the center when transitioning into bioeconomy, and we believe that we are on a very challenging but inspirational journey, one that will not only be good for the climate, but it will also create new jobs new businesses, and new export opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Knapp. And now I invite you and Minister Rehn to come up to the podium and uh, take part in a session of questions and answers. Please, here. You sit here, Therese and Oli here. And now I invite you to put questions. Welcome. There we have a gentleman. Short questions. Uh, my name is Antti Kivima and I'm from NC Partnering. <coughs> I have, I tried to make it short. EU policy has one fundamental mistake here, which is also being seen already in the speeches subsidizing very low value energy use only. I think that's the wrong way to do. Higher value products are not in the core as they should be. And as some uh, sawmill man in the beginning, so I would like to say that the industrial scale wood-based building would be the fastest and the best way to promote also climate change. As is well known, but not, let's say, not everybody accepts it, is the concrete and cement use today they uh, are about 8% of all CO2 emissions in the world. 8% is a very high figure, and we could do a lot by using more wood in the building. So my question is, what is EFI or other, other let's say, people around here going to do to make EU change from subsidizing low-value energy use and to go for products and materials, not only wood-based building, but also the other things. Olirian, please. Thank you. In fact, um, I would not uh, fully concur with you when you say that uh, the EU is uh, subsidizing the energy use of, uh, of uh, bioenergy bio products or bioeconomic bio uh, products. Uh, there is no subsidized system uh, as such. Uh, if you refer to the emission trading scheme, for instance, uh, or if you refer to uh, climate policies, uh, yes, uh, they, uh, they try to direct uh, economic and uh, energy production uh, to uh, less uh, polluting uses uh, and uh, less uh, polluting waste of, from the point of view of uh, climate change. Uh, but uh, that's uh, neutral to different uh, forms of production and different sources of, uh, of uh, energy. I agree with you on, uh, on one thing which is important that, uh, of course, uh, from the point of view of, uh, say, Finland or Sweden or any other country which has uh, big reliance on, uh, on forestry, it is important that uh, we can uh, increase uh, the added value we get uh, from uh, these uh, uh, forestry products. Uh, and uh, that's why one of the key priorities uh, of uh, the Finnish government is uh, to increase the use of uh, wood uh, in uh, uh, construction in, in buildings, uh, and uh, this work is ongoing. Uh, and of course, uh, we can make uh, some progress uh, by way of uh, reforming and revising uh, the regulations and uh, providing some support for this uh, in terms of uh, research and uh, innovation. But uh, in the end of the day, it is uh, also a matter of uh, how the construction industry sees uh, 
demand and, uh, and supply and uh, what kind of uh, business uh, decisions uh, are made uh, in the construction sector. Having said that, uh, we have uh, enough uh, uh, wood in the forests uh, for different uh, uses uh, in Finland uh, and in Sweden, and uh, therefore I would not uh, put this in contradiction to itself. More questions? Uh -huh. There must be. There we have a gentleman. Please. Ilpo Tikkanen from Metsämistin Satio Foundation. I have a very short question. How do you see the policy coordination related to forests and forest sector in EU and Commission? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I could say that uh, I'm an expert on this because uh, in uh, 1994, when there was a vote in the European Parliament on uh, the accession of Finland uh, to the European Union in Strasbourg, uh, and the very same day there happened to be the press conference of the first ever European Union forestry strategy in Strasbourg, and I attended that press conference uh, as a keen spectator and uh, followed the debate uh, ever since. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, there has been, uh, for those who, have not, who are not initiated to this, there have been two schools of thought, uh, even in, uh, in the Nordic countries. Uh, one is that uh, keep uh, the European Union away from uh, any decisions related to forests, uh, because it only increases uh, regulation and uh, excessive administrative burden. That's one school of thought. Uh, it has its merits. Uh, another school of thought is that um, if you do that, uh, then you only leave it uh, to those who do not understand forestry from the economic point of view. You leave it, uh, for instance, uh, to uh, uh, DC environment of the European Commission, which has a little bit different constituency and a diff little bit different uh, political objectives or policy objectives. So uh, one example of this was uh, a few years back, a few years ago, 2012 then 2013, when uh, uh, the then DC Agriculture was uh, intending to present uh, a proposal on uh, uh, the sustainability criteria for bioenergy. And uh, as Commission Vice President, I agreed with uh, the then uh, Commissioner for Agriculture that we will not proceed with this uh, because, uh, and uh, this as uh, some piece of information for the former colleagues in the European Commission, this was uh, a very bad proposal it would have led to, uh, say, Mr. Persson having to present his uh, own plan or any other forestry owner present his own or her own plan of uh, sustainability criteria in that forest, uh, which would have made it uh, in the Nordic conditions of uh, small ownership, uh, small ownership. Uh, life would have been uh, impossible and uh, the European Union would have become even more unpopular in this country than uh, has, uh, it, is it is already. So we stopped that. Uh, now the Commission is making uh, some kind of proposals uh, concerning uh, bioeconomy sustainability criteria. Uh, I think it is understandable, but uh, I think it is not necessarily wise to present uh, new legislative proposals. Uh, there are other ways and means of uh, facilitating reasonable development uh, in the field of uh, uh, European bioeconomy without uh, creating excessive administrative uh, burden for our citizens. Uh, and for our entrepreneurs. And I would like to echo Mr. Minister. Minister. Yes, uh, in this in Swedish, Sweden's position as well. Uh, what we are doing is taking an active role in uh, speaking with the EU and the Commission on uh, their ambitious ambitions when it comes to the renewable criteria. You cannot not take part in this discussion. There will be, come something and we should make the best use of it and uh, let them know how we handle the forest in the Nordic countries and you can do it in a sustainable way. And uh, if you allow me, I have also spent quite many years around the table in, in, in Brussels. And uh, from the beginning I was firmly against European Union uh, 
coming into the forestry activities. And um, I could see uh, that that also had a very good political support in Sweden and still has. But I can also see another development, and that is the European Union is coming into our forests via, for instance, the water directive. It's very, very important for us. Uh, habitat directive, environment directive, energy directive, and you can add a couple more. And uh, that is also a way to create a European forest policy without the dimension of production. And for us who are producers, who are uh, working in, in our forests, we already have a lot of regulations set up by Brussels. And uh, we need to balance this with also a production dimension no doubt. That is perhaps possible to do without creating a European forest policy, uh, but uh, it's not as easy as I thought it was 5, 10, 15 years ago. It's going in a certain direction. Then we must also know one thing. Just now we have a quite negative attitude to the European Union in many European countries, and uh, the Nordics are not uh, exemptions. But it is not so long ago since it was the opposite opinion. And uh, if you have been around for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years as I have been in politics, I have seen it going up and down. The only thing I realize is we will need the European Union as a framework for developing our industrial efforts to be international competitive in bioeconomy. If that also requires more of coordination regarding forestry activities, then I think we are prepared to accept it. But um, first you need to have a popular understanding of the problem you need to have the narrative I talked about before, and we don't have that yet. But I will not exclude that the European Union might become a more active part also in this respect. It will take some time, 10, 15, 20 years. It's not a long period from a historical perspective. But just now it seems like an eternity. But look 10, 15 years back. It was the time that Sweden and Finland entered the European Union 20 years ago. It was yesterday. So I'm a little bit careful today. I'm not so. I'm not so. Uh, I'm not so convinced anymore. Then also, and this is also quite funny. I have been a firm, firm uh, uh, enemy to the common and agriculture policy until I became a farmer. <laughs> that is also something to remember. There are different perspectives. But I'm not here to answer your questions. Others are. The gentleman there. There's a good answer anyway. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Esa Hermala, Finnish State Forest and Parks. So, any successful biostrategy, bioeconomic strategy, must be based on the fact that biomass is considered to be carbon neutral also in the future. Are the Finnish and Swedish governments confident that that will be the case in the European Union and globally? Also next decade. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Esa, for, for a very pertinent question indeed. And uh, I can only say that uh, we are really working in order to enable that, a decision by the European Union that uh, it is considered uh, carbon neutral uh, also in the future. If I'm confident, uh, I usually try to avoid uh, expressions uh, if I'm uh, an optimist or pessimist. Uh, I'm a realist. Uh, 
And I believe that uh, by working together with Sweden and uh, other like-minded countries uh, and those who believe in, uh, in science, uh, we can uh, win this uh, argument and uh, we can uh, ensure that uh, this goal of uh, carbon neutrality will, uh, will be maintained also in the future. I think Mr. Persson just said earlier that it's, uh, it's hard to give any uh, firm uh, statements on what will happen in the EU, EU coming forward. Uh, but I agree. Uh, we do our very best to show that it's, it's doable. And uh, we have uh, invited both the Commissioner Kenyatta and uh, Commissioner Sefcovic to Sweden to, to see our biomass production and the way we use biomass. And uh, we keep a close dialogue and hope for the best. Sirpa Välimaa, Stura Enso. Mr. Passion, you stated that people love wood products, but they don't like cutting trees. So how you are going to approach this challenge to promote the forest industry, circular economy and bio-based industry? I already let my brains relax when I heard the name of uh, Prime Minister Persson uh, to, to be responding to, to the question. I think it would be much more enlightening to hear Jöran, uh, Jöran give his uh, insights uh, on, on this. Uh, but in fact, he, he answered uh, in his uh, initial intervention already that uh, there is a positive image, uh, at least what we Nordics, uh, I, I guess the other Europeans as well, uh, link uh, to forests. Uh, and uh, forestry, and uh, therefore uh, we can uh, we can utilize this uh, positive image of uh, sustainable forest uh, management uh, in terms of uh, facilitating positive attitudes uh, towards the broader bioeconomy as well. I don't have so much to add, but to say we might be the champions when it comes to research and development, the scientific side of this project. But there must also be a popular acceptance of using our forests. Otherwise, our, um, our um, achievements in the academic world and in the research and development will find other places in the world to practice what they have found out. It's truly international. For this, for this reason, this is for us very dramatic because we have as a backbone in our economies in Finland and Sweden uh, the forestry industry and um, that must be modernized and that must be in the front line regarding research and development. If we lose that battle, our economies will lose a lot of resources and strength and that will have a tremendous impact on our societies. Cutting a tree means in the end in our societies having the resources to give a good education for a young kid. That is what we have to constantly tell and to also connect it with the latest and best in the scientific field. It's connected to the future. It is forest. That is the type of arguing we need to develop. And we have not always been taking this seriously. And we have a growing problem in many countries in Europe using our forest. We must realize that. And that is also sometimes based upon a forestry activity that is not always possible to defend. It is possible to have a sustainable forestry and it is possible to combine that with a growing industrial sector. That is what we have to achieve and that is in front of us. And there are no free lunches even in this area. Yes, Esko. Yeah. A couple of comments on that because I think this is an extremely important issue. Uh, and to be honest, this sector has not been very good in 
creating that narrative and uh, promoting its interests uh, uh, in, in, the, in the discussion. If you, if you look at, for example, construction sector, it's amazing how, how metal industry and, uh, and concrete, those producing concrete materials for, for construction have taken care of their interests. Even in, in countries like Finland and actually in Sweden, you have the same kind of tradition. So, so I think we have to be able, for the first, to create that narrative, and then we need joint efforts to, to promote our, our interests. And I, I very much like the idea that, uh, that the EFI will take active role in this, because we, we need uh, institutions that are able to, to, to promote that, that discussion. And then I think it's very important that also to understand that, that uh, not only economic development or social development, but also people's thinking doesn't go in linear way. And I think we are now facing a situation when, when this linear thinking is going to be broken. And uh, that is a great opportunity to, to get new ideas to, to flourish. And that marks the end of this session. Thank you, Minister Rehn. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now we have the European Union views on bioeconomy strategy. Thomas Arnold, advisor, sustainable bioeconomy, DG Research and Innovation, European Commission. Please take the floor. So, thank you. Good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, Minister. I'm really happy uh, to be here today and uh, give you some insights from the perspectives of uh, research and innovation on uh, the bioeconomy and how it may uh, further uh, evolve, focusing in particular on uh, forests. Now, EU forests and other wooded land, uh, on average across the whole EU, they uh, cover 42% of total EU land. Okay, in Finland it's much more, but this is the figure across the whole EU. The forest-based industries, they provide 3.5 million jobs, and there's a lot of diversity across Europe. And uh, I can tell you I'm myself also a small forest owner. I own three hectares in the Ardennes. I'm cutting or getting cut trees from time to time. This provides some revenue and keeps, uh, keeps the forest uh, up in good health. Okay, looking at this, what do you see in this picture? Many things. Wood, of course, but you see much more than uh, wood. You see other uh, products, you see ecosystem services, you see uh, recreation. So uh, there's a whole multifunctional uh, value of the forest, and this also requires a lot of innovation uh, to capture this multifunctional value of uh, the forest. I've been told to uh, reflect on lessons and uh, possible uh, ways beyond. So one may uh, also be beyond wood. What more is there in a forest than wood? There's been recently a policy conference in Brussels, uh, the 23rd uh, of May, looking at wood and uh, at all the other multiple services. And we've had the Vice President addressing this conference, insisting on the high value of all the other products that you could get uh, out of the forest. And uh, it's not only capturing all the value of all those products, it's also uh, the negative uh, emissions process that uh, forests can uh, provide. He's, of course, talked about uh, the timber and uh, forest industry in Finland and about uh, Finnish forests and uh, the Finnish culture. Okay, you all know this uh, with the lakes and the saunas and uh, so on. He's also talked about new innovative uh, products that you get out of uh, 
the forest, bio products. And this is uh, not only wood, uh, this is also wood. This is wood for new industries, much more smarter construction industries. This is also cosmetics, this is chemistry. This is uh, a lot of things uh, that you can get out of wood and out of the forest. There's also sustainability, of course, this is important in uh, the context of the new circular uh, economy. And uh, Katainen, Mr. Katainen has also uh, drawn attention to encouraging the cascading use of wood, uh, use, then reuse, and uh, recycling before its energetic uh, use. There's a wide range of specialized SMEs also that are providing key services. So it's not only products. In the bioeconomy, we've a lot been focusing on products, but the whole economy now makes a shift uh, also towards services, towards solutions. So maybe one of the questions that we, uh, we could ask ourselves is how do we also incorporate much better in future this concept of uh, services into the bioeconomy? In that conference, there were a couple of other flashlights from the European uh, Environment Agency in Copenhagen. Uh, what are those forest ecosystem services? What are the threats? Uh, EASAC has uh, asked, and it was a Finnish lady, uh, Mrs. Berg, uh, the question if uh, bioenergy from forests are carbon neutral. So be aware this question uh, is widely discussed. Then we've, of course, now uh, in the realm of Paris, the issue of the negative uh, emission technologies, in particular, if we look at the 1.5 point, uh, 1.5 degree scenario, uh, we may need uh, negative emission technology. The IPCC lists uh, quite a few, and uh, afforestation and reforestation is currently the major one, which uh, can work at a large scale. There's a lot of scientific development about many other negative emission technologies ongoing. So, the EU forests, they provide nature-based solutions, ecosystem services, non-wood forest products, and those can also be used uh, very smartly and uh, research can uh, develop the use of those products. Innovative wood value chains, uh, I've seen in Sweden, you even make t-shirts out of uh, wood. Bio-based construction is probably something uh, where the bioeconomy can uh, replace to a certain extent uh, the uh, concrete economy. Forest-based industries, for instance, in the BBI and also uh, bioenergy. I'm front-loading my uh, key takeaways and conclusions. The bioeconomy concept is getting stronger in Europe and globally due to expected environmental, economic, social impact, such as on jobs, climate change, food security. In Europe, it is part of uh, important EU policies, such as the circular economy, the industrial renaissance, also renewable energy resource policies, increasingly also on national level. And in Horizon 2020, Societal Challenge 2, uh, we actively promote the bioeconomy, also research and innovation on forests, and also uh, in, an, in a complementary industry-led program, the uh, BBI joint uh, undertaking. We uh, realize more and more uh, that framework conditions are important, such as uh, standards, such as access uh, to finance, in order to deliver fully on the expectations of the bioeconomy concept. So this is clearly also one of the lessons that probably we have to focus much more on those framework conditions, on the right standards, on investments, on how to get access to finance and so on. Forests, okay, they are clearly important for the wood products, for the non-wood products, for the ecosystem services. Sustainable management of forests is clearly a shared challenge including for research and uh, innovation policy. 
The EU bioeconomy strategy, as you know, is currently under review. Member states' input in this process is very much appreciated. And uh, the strategy will probably be updated if deemed necessary to better encompass the decarbonization and also uh, the circularity while promoting industrial renaissance, dynamic regional economies, and the renewal of key sectors such as agri food, forestry, waste, marine, and uh, chemical, but also construction. In Bioeconomy 1.0, we focused a lot on chemical industry, but probably uh, construction has the uh, potential to become far more uh, important. So the conclusions, the bioeconomy is gaining uh, momentum. Several EU member states, they currently develop national bioeconomy uh, strategies, following the good examples uh, firstly initiated by uh, Finland and Sweden. Now Spain also has adopted the national bioeconomy uh, strategy. The forest-based sector is and remains important for the development of EU uh, policies in general, including for research and innovation. And supporting the role of the forest-based sector in the bioeconomy is instrumental in reaching a number of EU, overall EU goals, including some uh, of those on the uh, Juncker agenda. The Finnish and Swedish support of the bioeconomy is important and appreciated, with national and supra-regional bioeconomy strategies and initiatives building on initiatives already undertaken at EU level. They are very complex challenges. They require a high level of policy coordination across a range of policies that are key to the uh, bioeconomy and it's getting rather more complex than uh, more simple. You have climate, you have energy, you have agriculture, uh, and so on, while achieving sustainable economic growth. The role of forests in the de- and recarbonization of Europe is very important in the context of the EU and uh, energy and climate objectives. The EFI plays, of course, an important role in conveying to its members key messages on forest research and innovation at the pan-European levels in view, uh, your views on the future of the bioeconomy and what we can do further at EU level, they are welcome. So those were the conclusions. Now of a variety of uh, many slides and I will select on some of those. So first of all, what is uh, the bioeconomy? Okay, this you probably all know. Uh, those parts of the economy that use renewable biological resources from land and sea to produce food, biomaterials, bioenergy, bioproducts. This comes from the 2 or 12 uh, bioeconomy strategy. If you zoom into this uh, graph that uh, we use very often, you see that sustainability is at the very center. Then it's about using better what we already use to ensure food security, uh, moving away from a fossil-based economy and bioeconomy. Forestry, of course, comes in in this uh, green part, but then also using well what we don't use yet. And this is, in particular, unlocking the potential of seas and the ocean, because the land is limited, but the seas and the ocean there's still a lot of uh, potential which are not yet fully unlocked and which are important for uh, the bioeconomy, which is about using biological resources to produce more and better from less. And in particular, research and innovation uh, is crucial to enable the crea creation of new bio-based value chains from primary production, but increasingly also from waste waste streams uh, and uh, maybe we even need in future add a third column uh, to the right of this uh, scheme which is greenhouse gases because you know that research also now goes on how can we capture and directly use greenhouse gases as a feedstock. Okay, this is then uh, used for all kinds of uh, nice bio-based products the bioeconomy is part
part of the circular economy. In the classical model from the MacArthur, L. MacArthur Foundation, it is the left side, the biological circles. From the NOVA Institute, we now have a new model which integrates the uh, technical and the biological circles uh, in one graph. And this is the classical model of the uh, circularity of the uh, renewable uh, resources in the power economy. And this is a diagram which shows the different feedstocks, the processes and the products coming out of this. And uh, I can predict that uh, we probably need to put increased focus on waste in the update of the bioeconomy uh, strategy uh, in addition to primary uh, products. There's more in the primary uh, in the bioeconomy than only uh, primary biomass. And if we take the circular economy seriously, then waste is becoming uh, much more important for chemicals, for all other kinds of products, for fibers, for animal feed and food, for fuels, and of course also for heat and power. Getting thick, uh, facts and figures about the bioeconomy is very complex because you have sectors which are partly bioeconomy and partly not, like the uh, chemical industry. If you look at the domestic extraction of biomass in the European Union, you see that agriculture for, uh, currently is the bulk. Forestry is only 11%. Uh, the uh, biomass balance in the European Union, it is mainly uh, consumed for food and for animal feed purposes, which represents 61% of the whole biomass uh, consumption. And animal feed alone represents 48% of total use of biomass. Bio, uh, the bioeconomy uh, provides a turnover of 2 trillion and employs 17 million people. Uh, where is the turnover? Mainly in the food be uh, and beverage sector. And where are the jobs? Mainly in agriculture. If you then uh, want to draw a map of bioeconomies in the different member states, we find that there's a lot of diversity. And this diversity is, uh, of course, very important and, of course, needs to be uh, exploited in the sense that there cannot be a one-size-fits-all solution. You have a couple of countries with a bioeconomy uh, dominated by agriculture. You have other countries with a bioeconomy more geared towards agro-food and bio-based chemicals. Other countries, they focus on forestry downstream industries, and uh, others are non-specialized bioeconomies. Uh, now, why do we need a bioeconomy strategy? This is to increase with the increasing global population, the rapid depletion of many resources, the increasing environmental pressures, climate change. Europe needs to radically change its approach to production, consumption, processing, storage, recycling, and disposal of biological uh, resources, maintain, create economic growth and jobs in rural, coastal, industrial areas, reduce fossil dependency, improve the economic, environmental sustainability of primary production, processing industry. This is from the 2012 uh, communication, you know it. So this is the narrative of the bioeconomy 1.0. If you look at the latest uh, uh, graphs or coming out from the IPCC, if we take uh, the 1.5% uh, scenario seriously, at current rate of emissions, we've six years left to uh, eat up the whole budget. Uh, 21 years left, uh, left to remain below 2 degrees. And if we go on with business as usual, it will be 3 degrees warmer in 2070. Food is first to be hit by climate change, possibly badly. But food is also, this looks very complex, but it's very important. If you look at the left column, you see uh, the final use of services uh, producing greenhouse gas emissions, food is 30% and construction is 15%. So this highlights very clearly, as already uh, said, 
Uh, what can the bioeconomy do, not only to clean up our own mess within food, but also within uh, construction? Sorry, we are running out of time, yeah. but if you can make it a bit faster. Planetary boundaries, more obesity, okay. Sustainable development goals, okay, many uh, reasons for uh, a bioeconomy. And we often also use this one which we like a lot. Sustainability. Maybe this becomes more important in Bioeconomy 2.0. And there's the classical model of the sustainability uh, with the little cross section of sustainability uh, between the in, uh, social environment and economic. But there's also now an other model, a uh, nested model of sustainability with uh, a robust and resilient economy depending on uh, human health and well-being, which needs an, uh, an intact and functional uh, environment. So this is the timeline of the uh, bioeconomy policies. Important uh, to know that there are the three pillars, investments in research and innovation, policy interaction, stakeholder engagement, uh, market competitiveness, then, by economy observatory, by economy panel, okay, industrial renaissance, those are uh, things which have uh, been part of the first generation of the bioeconomy so far. Now, we also have to consider the overall 10 Juncker priorities with one, two, and three very closely uh, linked to the uh, bioeconomy. Bioeconomy in Horizon 2020 is uh, very uh, important. Horizon, uh, Horizon 2020 is the new framework program of research and innovation, coupling research and innovation in one program, and it's challenge-based transdisciplinary. It has three pillars. One of them are the societal challenges, and we are in uh, challenge number two. And uh, in agriculture and forestry, and also in 2.4 bio-based industries and the bioeconomy, uh, uh, we have forestry specifically mentioned in societal challenge two. We also have to consider the three Commissioner uh, Mueda's priorities on open innovation, open science, and uh, open to uh, the world. Now, this is the to-do list uh, which we have got. Uh, forestry is not specifically mentioned, but of course it is uh, important uh, everywhere. Investments, markets, and the regular environment uh, really becoming more and more uh, important uh, with the links to ESIF, with access to finance, through uh, the structural funds, with market conditions, the regulatory environment, and also the new uh, Juncker Fund. I leave all those slides in the presentation for you uh, as a reference material. It is not necessary uh, to uh, comment on all of them. We are now in a process of updating the bioeconomy. You find in the slide also uh, the roadmap and the calendar, you see that uh, we count on member states and regions uh, to help us in defining the new 2.2 bioeconomy. We've had a manifesto in Utrecht, and in this Utrecht stakeholder manifesto, forestry was explicitly mentioned even among the flagships, there is one possible flagship in this manifesto or manifesto of the stakeholders on building with innovative uh, wood products. Regions are very important. Uh, I am not uh, commenting on this, uh, just to know regional bioeconomy uh, strategies uh, are crucial. Then also we have now a foot pillar and there is uh, 
uh, conference in sorry, uh, sorry, October. Sorry, for we are now yeah, running out of time. Yeah, research to... innovation uh, agenda for food proofing, nutrition and food system. And I think with this I can uh, close. Because food and nutrition, you know that there is a perfect storm coming up. And uh, we need to make sure we can uh, feed our 10 billion in 2015. And this provides a very important innovation opportunity. You will also see many new interfaces which have not yet been maybe fully thought about. How will the bioeconomy interfere with the new plastics economy? Interface with uh, nature-based solutions. Interface with eco-innovation uh, economy, with green growth, the low-carbon economy economy of ecosystems, the ocean economy, the alignment of health and sustainability agendas, how will we embrace the fourth industrial revolution, convergence of technologies and artificial intelligence, how will we interface with education, with employment, the silver economy in an aging society, the collaborative in the sharing economy, the citizens' biotech economy, Resilience, peace becoming more and more important because also uh, security externalities and migration. And how will we interface with globalization versus identity and community? And this is now a whole series of new things uh, in innovation that could be interesting. Would you find? in many different places, even where you don't expect it. Not uh, all no, plastics... I'm sorry, I have to conclude yeah. now, because, because I, Thank I think you. It's, it's fine. Thank you. In those slides, you can look at yourself. And the last point I want to make is new bioconstruction materials, and bioconstruction is not low-tech, as sometimes considered. Now skyscrapers are being built with wood, so wood is very much high-tech and will require a lot of research and innovation. Thank you for your attention. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'm sorry but, to interrupt you, but, but we, have, uh, we have rules. And, uh, and uh, that material will be distributed to you. Now we have another uh, speaker from the, from the European Union uh, side a member of parliament, uh, Mia Petra Kumpula Natri. She is a um, member of the uh, Committee for Industry, uh, Research and uh, um, Energy, and also chair of the Bioeconomy Working Group uh, uh, in the context of, uh, of the parliament. Mia Petra, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And I must say that I do not necessarily represent the whole parliament's ideas always, but I may be. Take you try, a try <laughs> I, I take you a tour that how a Finnish person fits in the parliament, being there for two years and trying to find out the reasoning behind the different ideas people come with on the bioenergy and bioeconomy and on construction and the wood and the forest and, and, so, and so, because it has been an experiment for a Finnish person to go there. Uh, a lot has been said. If you, did you find it? seems that uh, I have a wrong. I, get, I can make it short and not to present you anything. Put some nice picture with the green stuff. So we, we save some time and I do more. Con I have been listening carefully so I can more comment what has been there. The big circular picture you started also that it's saying that bioeconomy already exists. It exists in the European Union context, it exists in the market, exists in the Brussels, it exists in the uh, uh, Parliament. So, so we do have it here. But then also I challenge, and I very much welcome that it will be reviewed, the whole bioeconomy strategy for Europe, because it also sets unlocking the potential of seas and oceans. My question, why doesn't it, doesn't it want to unlock the potential of forests? As 42% of the land, 
And I, I think I could say also that Hogan, Phil Hogan visited uh, uh, a morning discussion in the parliament and he took it, the sustainable forestry, as a key message also, that it is a potential for what we have agreed in Paris climate agreement, it has a role for forests. And then when we make the forestry sustainable way, we can see that we, we should maybe uh, have it in the new strategy, bioeconomic strategy, take out the potential of the forests. So also, it's the figures and the numbers, how much bioeconomy bio employs, where is the turnover. But 20% of the bioeconomy turnover comes from the forest-based bioeconomy. And with a lot more potential that some other sectors do. I put it very politically right away and I say that it is very much chemistry oriented at the moment. It lacks totally the wood construction. It doesn't mention, it doesn't take sawmills inside at all. So maybe it is the size of the lobbying power in the Brussels that also can be seen sometimes. And the forestry is important in some countries, not everywhere. But I had a visit of the MAP's colleagues from ITRE, the committee I'm with, and the environment, and there were many nationalities who really started to think their potential of their forests. So I think there are positive signs in the, in the air. So, as, as this is also organized by the European Forest Institute, I say that I'm the strong supporter also the enhanced role for European Forest Institute, maybe to give us some scientific background when to tackle these problems and when to tackle these challenges, that it, what could uh, science help us when we look at the forest-based potential on the bioeconomy. So then the joint initiative program by the Commission could be good to have here in Joensu. So, the often mentioned wish is that have some coherence in the politics we are doing in the European Union. At the moment, it is not only that the new forest strategy is put in practice by Hogan and other in the Commission. We had it ready, and that was my first ever file I was working for in ITRE committee, the shadow of the opinion. But I got involved because that was first ever task I had. And it was good to learn. Good to learn the different uh, perspectives in the forestry. The different ideas people have, the politicians, but also the uh, people working in the commission and in our house. Um, a colleague said that should we ask and add here a creational activities or should we answer uh, add here in the new forest strategy that every city should plant some trees in the cities and i would say oh you don't know you're talking something that is jobs hundreds of thousands of jobs in the nordic countries and you're talking about planting some trees in the uh, cities but then there it was one assistant who said that <clears throat> excuse me, this is a new forest strategy, not a park strategy. So that, that was my relief. But really to put some perspective on the targets we are doing in the European level, it, it is necessary and I, I admire parks. I love them, in Brussels you need them. But then also I must say that the picture, the, the gentleman, uh, Arnold, just show, show me, uh, it was taken in the, the blue forest in Brussels, I recognize it because it's, it's the most beautiful place on earth on the May, the Blue Forêt. But it, it was a joke also for a Finnish person lived in the forest, from the forest, and for the future of forest, that there you can walk on the pathway, and then there is a sign that do not step away from the path to the forest. And that's not a forest on, on the sense that we are talking about forest when we are talking the economy of the forest. That's a park, that's the nice to go and see, and that's kind of good thing. Um, multifunctionality was one question also that we face nowadays in Brussels. And it is difficult for a Finn to see that. We do have every man's right, is it the right term in English, that everyone can go pick up berries, Everyone can go and hunt in the forest, whether it's owned by the state, whether it's owned by your passion, whether it's owned by my mother. We can go and hunt. 
We can go pick up berries, we can go up, pick, pick up mushrooms. And I don't want to see EU to saying that these are values that uh, eliminate possibilities to count what the wood price is on the markets. This is everyday life for our family. It's my mother still with very bad legs, limping or, or, almost, and bringing the berries for a whole family. The only problem is to take them f via airports to Brussels because the, you cannot carry frozen berries. I've tried it and they blocked me at the security. So multifunctionality is there, of course. It's not one or another, at least not in Finland or not, not in the forest that I've been visiting. You can camp there. And you only cannot go to the 100 or 200 meters from the uh, yard. But these are the questions that I never thought that I have to explain to someone. But then we, do, we had the 10 MEPs in Finland and we visited the forest site. And at, actually it was an historical visit because it was two committees together. ITRE committee in charge of the industry, innovations and energy. And ENVI committee in charge of environment and, and consumer, uh, the healthy pr production. So we visited together the forest site, we drank water from the well, uh, we visited the sawmill, and very honest question was that, hmm, how should we think this one, because there is no waste. How can we legislate this one, because there is no waste, how we put this in the circular economy? Because every chip or every fiber of the wood was used. You had the pellets, after you clean the floor, there is some dust left. You put them into pellets. Then some parts you decorate your gardens. You'd make business out of everything. Finland is not that rich country that we didn't invent it already a few years ago. It's every chip of the wood uh, uh, and, and the f uh, wood is, is used when you go there. And second uh, observation I had that we visited wood element factory uh, and colleague of mine who is strongly also with me the, on the idea and opinion that it's strange that wood and construction is not in the part of the bioeconomy uh, strategy as it could replace cement and concrete as was mentioned here in the question, which are very energy intensive. So why doesn't he see more wooden houses in Finland? Why so few wooden houses in Helsinki? And I would say that let the Asians compete that who has the highest building in the world. Shouldn't we compete who has the highest wooden building in Europe? And I wonder why Finland, or I haven't heard Sweden is, is competing that. I heard Norway is doing something, I heard Austria. So I want to challenge many stakeholders here that please take these showcases that we can also champion, that we can, and there is knowledge. I know many industries have now uh, com commented and are commenting also the commission that wood construction is something and I'm happy to hear that it was mentioned that might to be included in the, in the uh, future strategy for the bioeconomy. So these were the observations also my colleagues had when visited a site in Finland. No waste, not always necessary to find new legislation there. Wooden construction more, multifunctionality, it's not black or white. And then value creating is, is somewhat not that easy to say to, to do. So if we have succeeded that in Finland and in some countries, why not to succeed in, in the European level? And Oli Rehn, the minister, put it very well. Sometimes you are afraid that Europe would not let you be as progressive as you want. But at the same time, some believe that Europe can be progressive as a whole as well. And I try to believe for the last, last one and, and believe for the common European Union solutions as well. So if I put together, why do we need bioeconomy? We do need bioeconomy. It's not something that why do you have to take again the sustainability up on the agenda? We need it because of the post-fossil society. Uh, Mark Palashi here in the started that we need to move from fossil to the bio-based circular economy. And I want to add one megatrend more. And that's my other hobby uh, in the parliament, it's digitalization. I love when I heard uh, Ansip once quoted that even the cows, they produce more milk after the digitalization. 
And I know many people here that when you have knowledge of the forest and you know what's growing in the hectare you have, you get more wood productions. But there is even more I learned on the robotics last week, and I want to share that with you because it sounds like a future, but it's nowadays already. The dramatic change will happen in transportation also. We know that. And yes, we know there has been some difficulties, and there is some difficulties still that compare electric, electric car and the biofuels. And I think we need both because that, that's not overnight that we will have electricity cars all over produced by renewables, non-fossil. And then if we want to put the, that to happen as, as was so from IPCC, we need quick solutions. But what I learned, and I don't know how many of you know, have you heard about uh, droids or you have seen them in the sky? And I talked with my children less than 10 years. What's the problem? It's, of course, charging and batteries. But there is an institution that have tried already that they can eat bugs. And that comes for the biofuels then. So there is a future for the even biofuels, not maybe wooden biofuels in, in the air, but anyway, a lot will be happening and we need the knowledge of the bioeconomy because in the end I had some pictures here and one of the pictures from, was from the panel, high level panel, where I represented the parliament then. And then there was a very basic level discussions as I had to argue with the DG environment representative, Mr. Rosa, who is in charge of this bioeconomy sustainability criteria, because he insisted comparing coil and wood on the burning. And I think European Union should respect IPCC, not only the years and reflect something, some parts of it, but IPCC has agreed that it's carbon neutral when we, it comes to the wood. I had colleagues who didn't speak very good English, so I've been drawing a tree that yes, when it grows, it absorbs the CO2, and only when you use it, it em emissions are there. But if you build a house, it will be a storage for 100 years and a residues will be used for the bioenergy or whatever solutions. Solutions are there, there are markets, there are people fighting for these particles of the trees. So I believe that all kind of uh, uh, hierarchies is impossible to make in the cabinet of the parliament or, or even commission. So arguing on some basic things that if we do have a sun, soil and rain, there will be biomasses forever. If there will not be biomasses, there will not be even European Union, not to talk about Brexit or something else. If there is biomasses, we need to take care of the sustainable use and make it wise. So then I, my motivation is to work to make Parliament and even Commission to seek for the possibilities for the forest-based biomasses that we need them and, and they are the solution for the big picture we have ahead. So I think uh, also I'm waiting, the, this is just a tiny detail, but the bioeconomy exists also elsewhere, not only in European Union. And we are not leading the way. And that's my very big worry. I learned only that in USA they have bio-preferred program when it comes to the public procurement. I had a written question on a commission and they said that yes, they are preparing and I think they are still preparing and seeing the possibilities that could we have something like bio preferred when you have a fossil and bio product that in uh, public procurement you could see it. Yes, we do have a green public procurement, but then we should have basic principles how we want to see and urge the bio economy to develop more and make room for it. I believe I'm still and I hope I will see you after one or two years, I'm still that optimistic that we will do a good sustainable bioeconomic strategy and not the bioeconomic strategy which is sustainable only for the nature, but for, not for the future investment, not for the future humankind and for the Europeans. We need urgently new business models, new ideas and, and sustainability for the world. And I hope the Europe could lead the way again. Thank you. Thank you, Mia Petra Kumpula Natri, member of the European Parliament. Now, I said before, there are two countries in Europe 
that has taken the lead. One is Germany. And uh, now we have the honor to welcome Professor um, Christine Lang, co-chair of the German Bioeconomy Council. Please take the floor. Thank you very much. I'm um, happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me to this uh, really very interesting workshop. Um, and um, I think now, after we heard a lot about what uh, politics can do, um, maybe we can have a look at what uh, policy consultancy can also try to do. So um, I'm uh, for the past four years, I've uh, been part of the German by Economy Council. And when I started in 2012, when Germany had the bioeconomy seen as something that is biomass to energy, and that was not well perceived with the public, and um, we started to rethink bioeconomy, and actually it, it, it all came out, uh, to, to be part of a bio, global bioeconomy summit last year, and we're still working, of course, after this, but that was one of the key points that we tried to achieve. Actually, by economy is nothing that difficult to understand. It, you could make it completely uh, complex and talk about every detail of it. But it basically, by economy is something that's really easy to grasp as an idea. It just is nothing more than, but not nothing less, less than reconciling human living with nature. So we have, uh, we have to try to restore natural capital ecosystems Innovation and green growth combine these two things and uh, get to inclusive and healthy societies. And uh, this all together, that is just this is bioeconomy. So it, it's not that, that difficult, but uh, of course it's, it's, uh, the way to, to get there is not that easy. If we look back a few years, then bioeconomy was something that is completely different from what we see today. In, uh, ten years ago, it started to get this bioeconomy concept. In about 2007, we had in uh, uh, Germany was presiding in the EU, and uh, we had this Cologne paper. It was called a first EU-wide paper on bioeconomy initiated by Germany. At that time, bioeconomy had a completely different view than today. It was a time when there was this peak oil, the scarcity of oil and fossil fuels and fossil biomass, or fossil raw material was discussed. Prices were steadily increasing. Biotechnology was already there. It's a very interesting and innovative um, technology. And bioeconomy was thought to be just a substitution of fossil fuels. This has changed over the last years. And when we look at bioeconomy today, what we see now is that we have, um, that there are more new explorations of uh, oil. Uh, the availability of oil is rather, rather good. So it, it's not really a decrease uh, or complete. You have uh, volatile prices, low prices. So you cannot really count on this, that biomass is uh, um, more, it's just more expensive or cheaper than, uh, than oil or more expensive. In addition to biotechnology, you now have these digitalization, which is a bit about the converting technologies that come into the field. And of course, we have all these different global assessments like the climate agreement, CO2 neutrality to be have till 2050. So looking at this, you will see that there's a completely different picture going from substitution now to innovation for sustainable development. I think this will accompany us for the next years if we look at bioeconomy. And, and a good example is uh, if you look at the um, sustainable development goals that have just been put up, you find that uh, bioeconomy can indeed uh, in, uh, contribute to a number of these goals, and, and we just put on there a few of them, and uh, you can go into many of these and see that Baikonur must play a part in, attain, uh, in achieving such goals. 
looking around the world, you're completely right. It's not just EU and European countries that are part of the uh, bioeconomy movement, let's so. uh, The Bioeconomy Council, German Bioeconomy Council last year put together this um, uh, international plan where all bioeconomy strategies are found in the world. In some countries, they are not called bioeconomy, but if you look into the strategies, you see that it's basically bioeconomy. Um, you see, um, and, and I completely agree, you see a lot of economy strategies like in all the countries. There are only some, the gray ones, that not have any, but we, we know that many are discussing. So this is a global movement um, that uh, really has uh, um, started uh, somewhere in the, in the principal countries, but it's uh, going into different, in all the different countries. Now the question is, um, is this something that, uh, do they all want the same? Let's call it at this. And of course the answer is no, um, because it, it depends, it clearly depends on what the, uh, what the countries are aiming at and what their basic is. So we see a whole complexity there. Even if we just look at uh, the de development in Europe, we can see this. And uh, just mentioned there are many countries are now in this um, policy developments, like Spain, they have just uh, adopted an action plan in March. Uh, France and Norway, we know that they're both um, involved in setting up uh, dedicated strategies. Um, in Germany, the uh, bioeconomy strategy uh, is just uh, put into under evaluation um, and to see what has been achieved over the last years and to set up the second phase of that. Uh, and there are some other countries where strategy development is in progress. In addition to this, it's not just national ones. It's also that you find macro regions. We're here, of course, Nordic countries. They are doing things. The Baltic Sea region, uh, they fo formed a um, bioeconomy council in February this year, a blue bioeconomy roadmap in the Nordic countries. And we also see this region forum in um, Eastern Europe. And to make it even more complex, you sometimes see regional um, complexes, smaller, below country, uh, national level and uh, see all these different reasons. And I think all these um, uh, developments are, um, uh, are necessary to represent the complex part of um, a bioeconomy and to make those seen. So I, I guess the, the major challenge for European uh, government and for the European Commission is to put all this under an umbrella and not, not more maybe because there are so many initiatives, but just look if, the, if you find an umbrella for all this. Looking at all these different things, we, we can up when we looked into this, that there are still common challenges. And, and maybe this is also a very important point to point this out. It's, it's regional diversity, it's complexity, but still, if you look at it, there are some challenges that are really found in all, this, in all these countries and all the strategies. I will point to four of those. And this is, in my opinion, the most important. The first thing is this support and buy-in from society. And we have heard this word of having a narrative to, to get people in, to, put the, uh, put, uh, to, to engage uh, society on this as one of the most important things that we are facing in the next years. Because if we do not recognize that society is one of the main drivers of bioeconomy, we will probably fail in the future. The second thing is, which I'm a biologist from, by training, so this for me is clear, but maybe we all should, should talk about that. Know-how is one of the second drivers. So innovation and, and know-how and setting up technical breakthroughs uh, and thinking about bio-based um, sustainable processes and scaling up especially is also the second major uh, challenge we are facing. Of course, we always look at, I'm, I have a, I'm CEO of a company, so I, I know the next one, it's cost competitiveness. We will have to look into these novel products and services that are, can compete on the market, but still we have this possibility, uh, you mentioned it before, uh, public procurement, to give a chance of new product and new processes to get into the market and find a market in the first part. And of course, the fourth point then is we also need to monitor what we're doing and um, to uh, talk about it and, and find what the impact is on employment and on um, turnover and things like that. 
This is, uh, turns out to be quite a difficult point, not only on European level, but also in, on the German level. From all these, well, looking at these different countries and looking at the common challenges that we encountered, we had uh, um, the we, we set up the initiative uh, f about one year ago to have a global bioeconomy summit to get together all the stakeholders on the different countries internationally, a first time, in, and and have them talk about, discuss what are the challenges and where are we going to? Is there something that we can do on the policy level together? So we, want, we set up this meeting on bioeconomy last year in November in Berlin. And um, because, of course, we saw this, it's a, it's a dynamic development, and you are also uh, part of this and see this, but it's fragmented. We, it's time to connect actors to really get to the whole potential that there is. And of course, we know that we have to embrace diversity. We have to promote a systematic collaborative approach. That was the idea. And um, as last year was also the, the um, global alignments on COP21 and SDG, we thought it's timely event to just to put this together with bioeconomy. Um, we did this and, uh, in, in November in Berlin, and we had uh, more than 700 participants from 80 countries. Very important, we had also presented this before uh, in um, International Advisory Committee to, to get together uh, expertise from all the countries to understand where all the nationals uh, are, are looking at, what is important in different parts of the world. Um, and you see a lot of uh, partners involved, and um, we also involved uh, not only the professional part, let's say, but also stakeholders like NGOs and the civil society to get them all um, uh, put together. So, um, what has come from this? What are the lessons learned? If there are, if we try to put this as, as lessons learned from this. It, it was clear, that was a very important thing for me also to learn. There are common goals and we can indeed identify those. So it, it's all um, going for sustainable development and uh, unanimously it's food first. So food security is something that we uh, need to provide with a sustainable and uh, innovative bioeconomy. In some countries it's, uh, in, it's jobs is first. In other countries, it's uh, ecological transformation and health and well-being, depending on the state of the uh, economy of the country. However, as I said before, you do find huge diversities and you have to respect those. It is started with a definition. Some countries' health is part of uh, by economy, now that's not. And some have a technology and knowledge focus, others have a biomass focus. And of course, emphasis is different on the sectors and on the feedstock, depending exactly on the economy that, uh, that we come from. And uh, of course, the discussion has been very vivid on what approach and society implementation involvement can be done. So what you see from this is there is a lot of initiative, a lot of ideas, a lot of activity on this, but little policy coordination and integration in multilateral processes. So this, of course, is then one of the aims that has to be done. The International Advisory Committee has uh, set up uh, a communique uh, to, uh, to try to, um, to focus on a few points that are necessary and uh, the, uh, to come to the most important three points are these. Uh, what we need to do in the future is promote the uh, innovative uh, technologies. Second is establish good governance, national and international. The, uh, and third is to strengthen and initiate dialogue and cooperation internationally. And um, these three points, just a few words on this, um, promoting the technology, it's important, still important to invest in R&D because that, that has started with this, but uh, we need to, to, uh, to go on with this. It's, it's not a one, one day job, let's say. Uh, education is important to make people understand what bioeconomy is about and to want them to have bioeconomy products, let's say, to make them understand, to understand also what, the, what society is aiming at, what, they are, what they're wanting to do. Um, innovation capacity development, something that's 
very important also in Europe. We don't just have to stop at the idea at the academic level, but we have to see if we can put it forward into some uh, pilot scale experiments, into some uh, pilot scale products. Um, and this can also only be done if we stand the role of business and take business into this. And this will also, of course, increase the value at the end. Um, but in, for, the, for the German um, Bioeconomic Council, we see this um, uh, value chain uh, that uh, you start with a biomass, which is maybe the lowest value as uh, per se, but and the direct biomass use was as soon as you go into processing bio-based product and put in design pharma bionics, then you uh, create a higher value. And depending on uh, what the country uh, or the nation is, you can input put in more less knowledge components. For country just Germany, we are we are not very good in having we're not having much biomass. Maybe we should buy from Scandinavia some biomass. But what we uh, should uh, on the other is invest into is uh, putting more knowledge into this and setting up processes and intelligent um, products from this. Just as as uh, to 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 find the right way for each uh, country. The establishment of uh, good governments, we really need to, um, to get into dialogue with civil society. Um, we have started, as a Bioeconomic Council started this very directly, to get a feeling what people are thinking about bioeconomy, and we're very happy to find that there are lots of ideas in society that can be answered and can be fulfilled with this. Uh, we have to look into um, sustainable production, of course, um, and um, by economy is something that's international, so uh, international policy, and so it, it's well that uh, this is an international workshop to talk about this. <clears throat> and also on the monitoring, I mentioned that before. And uh, finally, to, uh, the third point was to get into international dialogue. Um, probably what we started to think about are some flagship projects that can be discussed more internationally to bring people together. That could be something like a bioprincipled city, or it could be something that's more the aquaculture or using marine resources, which is not just a national but international perspective. And of course, uh, we are thinking of uh, having a second Global Bioeconomy Summit to, to follow up this work and put this into a next, uh, next step. And finally, last slide, on the cornerstones, and we can talk about this, what are the drivers? We think the cornerstones are uh, of the bioeconomy uh, use, biological resources, identify the potential and talk about it use uh, the function and knowledge on bio, um, biological resources, so you see innovation and, and, and research is basic. Um, we need, as we said before, to address societal needs and have an open dialogue. This comes to the point of the narrative uh, again, and also to my point, I want to make that society can be the driver, maybe the best driver of bioeconomy. This includes that we educate uh, people also talking about things we are doing, um, cross-sector innovation, value networks, this is something people are living already, but we have to follow this up. Uh, and circular economy, uh, let's uh, bio, bio economy become a part of it, but uh, maybe we come to exactly this problem, there is no waste in bio economy, so maybe it doesn't work in the same way as it has been discussed before, but it's, uh, it's a perfect way to think about biological biomass and, and uh, things that you uh, develop. And last but not least, uh, we have to uh, get uh, bio economy into uh, sustainable development discussion and climate action discussion <clears throat> to make it to to anchor it to further points in the in the policy thank you very much thank you professor lang and you will later also come back to the panel and there you will have the opportunity to put questions to her direct now, before the coffee break, we have one more intervention, and that is Professor Marco Ollikainen, University of Helsinki and Chair of the Finnish Climate Change Panel, Science Perspective on Bioeconomy Strategies. Please take the floor.
distinguished chair, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, science <coughs> and bioeconomy. Bioeconomy is a policy slogan, and always when we scientists encounter a policy slogan, <coughs> it receives a lot of attention. Actually, any policy slogan is a challenge to scientists. It's a personal challenge and a challenge to whole uh, society. Because it requires us to think policy matters from different perspective from, or from different framework than we are used to do. Because now we are required to give answers to a very definite <coughs> uh, question. It is also a puzzle to academic uh, uh, um, audience because while politicians can afford to have loose concepts, scientists should not. So we need to try to trace out what actually is the content, what are the dimensions, and what is the meaning of the given slogan. And this is what has happened with the bioeconomy concept as well. We have examined the motivation and the meaning of the concept. We have studied how it relates to other policy uh, uh, notions, and we have discussed and analyzed about how the stakeholders like primary producers or industry has uh, received the notion. In this presentation, I will give uh, some highlights on this work. I think this we know quite well, and it has been present in, in previous uh, talks. So bioeconomy as a notion is very closely related to the main challenges that the humankind now faces. Climate change has been mentioned here. We need to reduce CO2 emissions so that we can keep the average global temperature well below 2 degrees Celsius and try to pursue even for 1.5. And in this work, we need all means of reducing uh, emissions, and we know that the forest-based products can do so. Furthermore, we know by Paris Agreement that by uh, the uh, latter part, latter half of this century, emissions must be balanced by sinks. And forests are a very large sink. The other main challenge for, for the humankind is population growth and the increase of middle class. Uh, by 2050, we are more than nine, uh, 9 billion. And by 2030, we estimate that 2 billion people enter uh, middle class. This means a radical increase in material consumption. This means that we need to be able to uh, provide food to a very large population. And again, we know that we can link, and bioeconomy very tightly links to meeting these challenges. It can help us, of course, to safeguard food supply, but it also helps us to meet the energy and resource availability requirements. The third main challenge is poverty eradication. It is a very difficult socioeconomic and political pro problem. But here again, bioeconomy may play a role. It helps us to combat famine, and it may provide poor rural people uh, income, and thus help there to increase the uh, standard of living. The fourth challenge mentioned here is actually related and partly created by the three first ones. We need to shift to low carbon economies. And it is well known that it is a costly enterprise. And we must find ways of doing it in a creative way so that we can maintain economic growth and jobs. And here we think that bioeconomy might help a lot. Taking another angle, if we want to think what bioeconomy is, what is the situation? And what is, what is, what is sort of the, the uh, place to which this uh, 
notion has been given. I narrow my discussion on forest-based sector only. Joseph Schumpeter was an economist <coughs> who had a slogan that we need, economists always need creative destruction because entrepreneurs need profits and the only way is to kill old and, and badly working uh, firms and industries and find new ones. And actually, if you look at the situation in forest-based sector, we have a situation where we have very strongly changing struct uh, structures. Perhaps it's right to say that we are in a situation where we have creative destruction of the forest-based sector. There are forces that uh, enforce traditional forest sector to take steps. The most important one of those is that for many forest products, the market is mature. If a market is mature, making profits is only possible by saving costs, but it has limits. May, the other way making profits is to make innovation. And that's why this is a strong enforcing driver towards a new system, and this new system I hear labeled bioeconomy. There are, of course, many other things, like competitive advantages have changed uh, around the world for, for forest production, and of course, this European Union's economic recession has been a very bad thing for all. At the same time, we have factors that help the shift to bioeconomy. Climate and energy policies has been mentioned many times, and also the other that I personally uh, uh, regard as a very important one, and it is technological progress and the possibilities that it opens to, to uh, all industries that are using forests. They allow new products, they help us to be more resource efficient. If I combine this to the fact that the European Union has now very large forest stock that has been increasing, is increasing, it means that we have techno technological possibilities and we have sufficient supply to do something radically new. A thing that we have not witnessed so much in the uh, uh, traditional forest sector is, of course, services and digitalization that was mentioned here. It will, in the future, help us a lot. Taking just a uh, slightly more concrete uh, look at these creative and, and, and destructive forces, I would say first that the demand for communication papers has decreased and will decrease. And the demand for many other papers has stagnated. That justifies a thing about uh, maturity of the market. Uh, we have witnessed the changes in this uh, uh, comparative advantage, mainly in the form that some investment have shifted uh, uh, regionally. The fast growing markets in Asia, they are inviting paper, uh, industries that are promoting those soft papers as Minister Ren mentioned, and on the other hand, there are uh, areas like South America from which we can produce pulp with a very low uh, production of costs. So this will fundamentally change the uh, uh, situation for forest, uh, traditional forest industries. Luckily, as, as, as Minister said, there is increasing demand for uh, pulp from these boreal forests which has saved our uh, uh, production. The creative forces are, of course, much more interesting. What we are now witnessing is that the forest industry and many other industries that are using uh, forest-based uh, materials, they are changing and revising their business strategies. And they are starting to invest to uh, uh, new forest-based products. From demand size, there is also a change. Actually, quite surprise, new demand for old products exists. Examples were given already, this sold pulp for textiles or tal oil for biodiesel. 
And for bioeconomy of, of forest uh, uh, sector, the good thing is that in many cases this demand is driven by the need to have forest-based materials to replace non-sustainable non products or materials that compete with food production or then materials that are from fossil fuels. And actually, we know tech, uh, and technology allows that we can use wood fiber to produce all same products that we can uh, manufacture from uh, fossil raw materials. So in, in this sense, the, the scene is very promising. And it is this from which I would like to draw the key features for forest-based bioeconomy. I would like to see that we set a new goal. It is a competitive, advanced, and climate more smart bioeconomy. It is not based on what we are used to do. It is based on what we should and what we will do. No business models which uh, enrich, uh, uh, which go towards consumers, new bioproducts and new industries. Traditional forest industry, of course, but also textile, pharmaceutical industries, more services in the market. It is the most rapidly growing industry uh, um, uh, 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 almost everywhere. And of course, we would have these traditional products, pulp and paper, uh, biofuels and bioenergy. But the new advanced climate smart bioeconomy would be uh, an industry or area where we produce high value added products and which has much lower dependence on business cycles than uh, we previously have used to. But of course, achieving this goal, it, it has many challenges ahead. I would like, in this occasion, just mention uh, three. First is related to climate change. We know already that carbon price has entered a uh, forest-based sector. Carbon price impacts directly <coughs> uh, by encouraging production of bioenergy, biofuels, and biomaterials and thereby it impacts through derived demand also forest management. But what we have not done yet is that we haven't optimized, we haven't thought that what would be the best way that the forest would uh, contribute to climate mitigation. This, what so far has happened, is just adaptation to climate policies uh, tailored elsewhere. But the time is to think how uh, we find the best way for the uh, forest product-based sector to contribute to climate uh, policies. This means that we must balance wisely wood use, enhance zinc, and material substitution. We can have them both. We do not have to compromise possibilities of production and growth. But we can do better than we do now. And this is the point where also the question of carbon neutrality enters the picture. I, I give just a brief comment in the next slide. The other challenge, and this is a challenge for policymakers especially, is that there are important trade-offs in developing forest bioeconomy in the short run and in the long run. Bioenergy may be important up to 2030, perhaps 40, but its role may decrease over time. Why? Because in energy production, wind and solar, a new uh, solutions will uh, uh, continue their increase. Transport, most likely electric cars will conquer, and there will be other fundamental changes in transport. So the question is how much to rely on bioenergy and how much to invest in other new biomaterials. The other thing that is related, especially, for instance, the European Union's becoming uh, 
uh, policy initiative concerning land use, land use change, and forestry. We are expecting for a proposal in July, and it relates to harvesting emissions and sinks in the short and in the long run. The discussion of carbon neutrality has been pretty heat here in Finland, uh, in Europe, and actually all over the world, because scientists have started to think uh, more concretely what, what, uh, how various uses, especially the uh, bio uh, energy use of wood, uh, will impact uh, climate. Natural scientists have in the invented the notion of carbon debt, and their calculations vary a lot, uh, but many argue that in the short run, using increasingly wood for bioenergy will increase first emissions, but it will produce climate benefits in the longer term. But the sh uh, horizon of climate policies is about 50 years. So how to balance this short-term and long-term aspects is an open question, at least among scientists who are strongly of different opinions on this matter. And for sure, this then translates also to policy discussions. The third sort of uh, trade-off in the short and in the long run is related to uh, the fact that Finland, for instance, now is investing in sort of old pulp, very well known over the couple of hundred years. And now we are taking this shift. Many people have asked, are we going backwards? And then the thing is how we sort of, in a sense, go back to the old so that we can promote new in the long run. This is related to many things, like we can use and we should use the profits from pulp production to the other elements of bio bioeconomy, like this Anikoski multi-product, multi-bioproduct multi uh, factory. It's very well possible that to, to, to finding out uh, and developing many biomaterials need to be done in association if, if, with pulp production. Because pulp mills gather timber from tim in huge masses. We can use, for instance, the bark of spruce to produce uh, uh, ma raw material for medicine. They are then in the pulp mill, easy case to take them out from the bark. And, and, and branches and other things, they have been collected in pulp mill, around the pulp mills, and they are easy to take for further production. So, but the thing is that we have to take care that this happens. If this happens, then investing in old means investing in the new. But this is really a challenge to achieve. The third thing has been discussed here already, it's, improve, it's improving policy coherence. Policy coherence, if you take the definition of vertical coherence, means that if we have any policy program that is targeting a given sector, it should not, uh, it should support policies, other policies targeting other sectors. At least it should not contradict those. So we should find the balance between quite many policies targeting forest-based sector. Of course, climate policies and bioeconomic policies must be coherent. Likewise, we cannot neglect biodiversity. So we, ha we have to think how to improve bioeconomy by while keeping uh, biodiversity at a good level. We need in general, a sustainable solution for, for um, these policy coherent things. This is a matter of how we write directives, how we like write laws, and this should be the expertise of not only research, but also policy making. And of course, if we have coherent policies, they boost, they boost the sectors that we are wanting to, to develop. And it's especially important that, that the policy makers uh, create synergies with the practical policy programs. And there are at least two which are very important for forest-based bioeconomy. One is innovation program as mentioned here, and the other is those industrial programs. They too 
are needed to help uh, bioeconomy to evolve. So summing up, uh, from science view, the notion of forest bioeconomy and forest bioeconomy especially is a very welcome uh, policy initiative. But we have, understand, have to understand that the notion goes much beyond what we do now. It is reaching something new and something uh, more advanced and more profitable than, than uh, our current performance does. Therefore, we need to boost those creative aspects that, and forces that we have in the forest sector. If we do this in a determined way, I'm sure that we will achieve much with bio, forest uh, bioeconomy. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Olikainen. Now we have a break, a coffee break, or a late luncheon, if you want to express it like that. Um, half an hour, not more. We are already a little bit behind schedule.
Start soon. So now we continue with the panel discussion. So you can start thinking about your potential questions or, or comments. Uh, we have a new speaker now in the panel, so we will start from, from her. We have the pleasure to have with us uh, Sofia Santos, who is Secretary General for the Portuguese Business Council for Sustainable Development. Is that correct? Uh, Sofia is an economist. She has really a wide experience. She has been working in the banking. Uh, she has been doing research. She has even been working for the Portuguese pulp and paper industry. She just published this year a book on the green economy. And I would like to start the, the panel discussion with a, with a question to Sofia, reflecting a bit on the, on the general picture. And I would like to ask you, how, how do you see in this rapidly changing, rather volatile economic environment, you know, the, the potential of attracting new investors? We heard during the, during the presentation today how to attract investors to finance the, the bioeconomy. How to do that in practice, you know? What is, what is our hook? Is this sustainability ethical question an attractive uh, potential hook to attract investors? And also, since you are from Portugal and we didn't have any intervention from Southern Europe, okay, I am from Barcelona, but uh, living, I am more a Finn now than, than, a, than a Spaniard. You can also reflect a bit from a, from a Portuguese you know, uh, point of view. What, how do you feel about the bioeconomy? What, what do you sense? Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And having said this, while well, being from the southern countries, I feel like a different animal in the room. So I'll try <laughs> to, you know, give you some, also some overview about um, our views in the southern part of the world, but that's, that's just in a few minutes. Well, um, trying to answer your question, I would basically join two issues which were referred uh, in the last two presentations, which is the issue of sustainable development. So basically, well, I think if we, you know, looking at bioeconomy as, um, as a driver and as a growing um, potential sector of economy, it needs to be linked with the concept, with the, with the, it needs to be really linked with the concept of sustainability and sustainable development. Well, b basically because uh, if we are dealing with nature and taking into account why we are here, why are we discussing the potential of bioeconomy, it's because well, different reasons, but basically we also, in the occidental economies, we consume high levels of consumption, too much, we consume too much, and on the other side, we also have the, the rest of the world that is going to grow, and people will need to consume different so sorts of goods. So there is a, here a trade-off in a combination between we, uh, in European countries, maybe trying to find smart ways of consumption of goods, and then different consumption, but eventually decreasing the amount of consumption that we will make in the future that will be eventually compensated with smarter consumption made by uh, uh, other countries that are growing in terms of, of population. But then, then again, I mean, the bioeconomy here brings um, a different stage and can bring together with the whole concept of green economy because as Jeffrey Sachs uh, also says, we might be going through the sixth wave of technology change and where the green economy is, can be a main pillar. And here, of course, the bioeconomy can also have a key role to play in terms of technology change. But 
in order to not commit the same mistakes that generally the market economy uh, committed in the past, which is overconsumption of, of resources, um, then maybe when we look at the bioeconomy potential and the alternatives of bioeconomy, we need to understand um, well, the economic value of the ecosystem services that were also referred here. So we can hear throughout the presentations uh, quite a lot of emphasis on, 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 the, on biomass and on the potential um, that nature has in producing new goods, so pr nature plus industrial, uh, uh, um, industrial production, smart industrial pr production can provide uh, uh, goods to be consumed, but also maybe we should take into account the ecosystem values, the ecosystem services that are underneath that idea. So every, should we also take into account the ecosystem services uh, the positive and the negative impacts, the economic value of the ecosystem services that are either created or destroyed when I'm producing a specific bioproduct? And should we um, do a full life cycle analysis and try to analyze what is the best bioproduct in terms of sustain sustainable development? So this is something that I think we, it's over the, the three last presentations touched, touched upon, upon those, that, that issue, and I think that's, that's quite relevant because there are other services that forest also produces. And of course, I'm, tol I'm, I'm talking about this because coming from the south, for us, bioeconomy can have different sectors, or for us, probably the stronger bioeconomy areas might be different from the Nordic countries. But then again, that's why countries are different, because ecosystems are different and nature is different. And then building on that, on the differences that several people here express the, the need to, to respect uh, the differences between countries. And once again, I'm trying to just go back and avoid, or at least trying to avoid the same mistakes we did in the past. So if we are dealing with bioeconomy, where it depends on the, on the local ecosystems. So a local ecosystem, in the, in the, here it's different from Germany and it's different from Spain, it's different from Portugal. If you aim to have a unique uh, regulation, European regulation, that might, I don't know, I'm not a policy maker, I'm just giving you some, you know, some, some doubts. Um, having a unique framework might not be the best in terms of the common goal of European well-being. And, and, and when we are dealing with nature, we cannot discuss with nature. So we cannot sit down and say, well, now nature, you have this ecosystem, I want you to transform yourself into another ecosystem. That doesn't work. So basically, that's when the linkage can come also together with, with the possibility of including other sorts of um, potential bioeconomy uh, segments, such as the tourism. Is tourism one part? Could, could tourism be a part of the bioeconomy? I'm just questioning. Could, um, could green infrastructures be included in the bioeconomy uh, sector? So, and these are slightly different uh, approaches, which also have an economic value and eventually can, ta can be taken into consideration when each country is doing a balance between what is the best sustainable development outcome in terms of the bioeconomy. If we measure what is the potential of bioeconomy in different countries, you have different options. And what I'm just saying is that it would be interesting to keep this in mind and, and see how would that be possible for Europe, for Europe to have um, this flexibility uh, in order to uh, incorporate different um, ecosystem services and different economic values that come from these ecosystem services. Just as a concrete example, and now going back a bit to, to Portugal. Uh, um, well, um, last month we had four and a half days of full renewable uh, energy production. So we, for four and a half days we, didn't produce, we had CO2, I can say, well, CO2 zero emissions, which means, of, of course, we need also in Portugal to, 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 to decrease our dependency on fossil fuels, but due to 
different strategies. In the past, we had a strong renewable, we also have biomass, but we have um, the hydropower, which means that, for instance, for us, the usage of, of wood, uh, eventually in terms of producing a low carbon energy, might not be so significant or such a stronger need as in other countries, even because we also have a, a, a no, front runner pulp and paper sector that has a final product with very high uh, value, as you referred, the previous um, uh, speaker referred to the need to, to produce high value final products. So in that case, for instance, in the South, we have a different Different, we see bioeconomy in, with different sources of opportunities. That, that's, that's the point um, I, just, I just wanted to make. And, um, and once again, that's why the differences need to be uh, respected, because at the end of the day, Europe has this ecosystem, because there are different small ecosystems, and all of them work together so that we can have the Europe we have. And when we are dealing with bio things, we it's, we are starting to interact deeply with, with, with nature, and we must be careful to not uh, to use the nature in a way that it's not self-destructing, in, in a way that we don't destruct the ecosystems, even if we are using it. So this is just, but if we, as you said before, if we take into account the, um, in every analysis, if we take into account the sustainable development goals, to try to see how a specific production can comply with sustainable development goals, then I think many of these risks would be minimized. Trying to respond to your question okay. now. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is relevant because if this nowadays, I mean, all of you from companies, most of you either have a sustainability report or those that are listed in the stock changes, you receive uh, questions from the, from the analysts that are from the social responsible investment funds, and you might say, well, they are very small and very few. They are very small and few, but it's a growing market, and, 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 and gradually the financial system will be asking much more questions about your sustainability practices than ever before. Even at European level, there are some documentation that I've come across that indicates that we might be going for the um, eco level of investment funds. So even money will have some kind of um, um, eco label indicating if that specific fund takes into account environmental and social issues. So what I'm trying to say is that if, if we don't embed this into the, any bioeconomy uh, project, we need to, because it's part of, if you are successful and looking for a company, you need to incorporate in your business really this, this, this topic. So that's why in order to attract investment, I think you need to look forward. So you need to understand how the world might be, of course, in 10, 15 years, and on those grounds, the issues of uh, sustainable finance will be, uh, will be much more present than, than today. And of course, then it's the typical, typical language. It, the, you need to identify, be very clear on, on the message in terms of the risks and, your, and the business opportunities, but always business opportunities taking into account sustainability criteria. There's very easily, we forget the sustainability criteria. When it comes to decisions in terms of money, very easily, we kind of prefer the short term than the long term. It's, it's part of our mindset. We need to change this mindset, but it, it's natural. So we need to, to, to really be concerned about when it comes to investment decisions and money investing, uh, take into account all these, all these topics. Um, also, and some European documents refer that, the fiscal measures, uh, well, I think as everything that is new and it happened in the past, we different sectors, but especially with this one that has stronger um, investment uh, costs to, to begin with. Um, there is, I think there is a need also uh, to create the demand and the supply to have some kind of um, uh, the, the fiscal policy also uh, play around in terms of either to incentivize consumption uh, from the consumer side and then eventually to have different VAT uh, taxes for bioproducts. It's something that if Europe wants to do, can do it. Mm -hmm. um, and or at the other, uh, on the other hand, also in terms of the production side, to have some uh, tax incentives if you are producing uh, bioproducts or if you have these concrete uh, specific uh, uh, concerns. And also on the investment side. So if you are a bank and you are lending money to a specific product or a specific company that is producing a bioproduct, maybe in terms of fiscal issues, the things can go around. I mean, the Holland has developed the Green Fund in the 80s, 
and, and with this triangular approach. So it was uh, some deduction for the consumers, also some deduction uh, for, the, um, for the companies, and then the banks got involved. And by doing this triangular approach, it was possible to develop a, a set of green projects and even what, what was called green banks in Holland. And you can see that was much stronger in Holland than in many other countries uh, uh, in Europe. So to finalize is, is these fiscal measures, uh, of course, asset, uh, as, um, access to finance, uh, not only about the European funds, they are very complex to, to get it, and you need to be a very strong company. You need to have uh, lots of um, years of experience in dealing with, with, the, with the European funds, but maybe at national level also to have specific funds that can help together with the venture capital companies uh, that can help and to promote this kind of approach and linking that with something that might be a bit you know, easier for and attractive for young people, which is linking this with sustainability entrepreneurship approach. So linking entrepreneurship with, with something that has a positive impact. And I think if you join, if you link the, uh, the technology, the IT, and if you link young population, and if you link it with the concerns that usually the millennials have on these topics, we might get uh, an, a, a good environment to be able to promote uh, what we could call or something similar as the, um, uh, the sustainable entrepreneurship uh, approach and by including different people and different, uh, from different areas. And then, of course, finally, the education. I mean, I'm, I'm, from, uh, I'm an economist, and, um, and it's very difficult to talk about these issues with economists um, because the, the main questions are they, they foresee that this is already solved, that the market solves these, these issues, and the market doesn't solve these issues. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. We would already have... Uh, excellent innovation processes and bioproducts easily, um, and therefore it's really it's really relevant to include economists and mainstream managers to to understand the difference between the short term and the medium and long term. Right. This is a kind of medium long term approach, and we have the mindset, the management mindset is on short term, and that's that's a right. problem. Thank you. Thank you, Sofia, for this new, fresh <laughs> insight into the, to the issue. Don't worry, I will come back to you for questions, but I will put a few more questions to the panelists, if you can uh, answer short, shorter now. Uh, Mr. Ajo, something that was not mentioned today, but I think Christine already signaled it in her presentation. What about the situation with the low oil prices and other commodities and materials like steel, for example? It's going down. Is this a risk for the bioeconomy, or is it rather an opportunity? How do you see this global picture? And then, if you can elaborate a bit also on, on the role of Scandinavia and the Nordic countries in leading the bioeconomy. There are big players like China, India, trying to move towards that direction. What is the competitive advantage of the Nordic countries? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for the first, uh, I, I think fundamental problem, both in business and, and government and, and decision making, both is that we are so committed to linear thinking. So we believe that the same trends we are used to have will be continued. And, uh, and think, think back, 1972, few of you have not been born 72, but, uh, but I, I was privileged to see that year. Uh, and, uh, and you remember, the Club of Rome published its report, and it yes. predicted. <laughs> you, you, remember, you remember that, yeah. <laughs> We are two, we are two. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and in that report they predicted that uh, we are running out of oil. And uh, that was maybe the most important conclusion, or run out of uh, fossil fuels. Uh, and that was uh, dominant thinking until 2012. I went to the United States, to Harvard, and, and I saw one report published by one uh, Italian professor who spent uh, time at, at Harvard, and he predicted that the United States is going to be second biggest oil producer in the world by 2020. Mm -hmm. And then discussion started, and they said, no, no, in no way, that is not going to be true. And then a bit later, uh, energy agency came, uh, international energy agency came and said that, no, it's wrong. Uh, the U.S. is going to be the biggest one. 
<laughs> and 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 that was that was changing the the whole whole story. And now I think that within few years we are coming to a new, totally new environment. We are thinking: Is it so that oil is going to be ending, or is it possible so that that the use of oil will end before oil resources and oil reserves? And my guess is that this latter one is more obvious than the first one. But another issue, which is familiar to the Finns, in that report, the Club of Rome said that that uh, Chinese and Indians will never be integrated into the global telecommunication networks. Do you know why? Because they expected that there is not enough copper in the world. Mm -hmm. hmm. Very logical conclusion. And they were right. With those, pre those premises, they made their calculation. And then suddenly, disruption took place, and mobile technology took over. This is my first comment. Second comment is that when looking at experience from business and government, this linear thinking is one, but second issue is balance between context and concept. We always like business leaders who are making good profit, and we say that they are good leaders, they, are, they, are, they understand the needs of employees, and, and so on and so on. It's bullshit. It's easy to be a good business leader when your concept is in balance with the context. It's, it's very easy. You don't have to be a fantastic leader. But sometimes it happens that your concept is not anymore meeting the requirements of the context. And it typically happens when context will be changed, not when context is changed, but concept is changed, but when the context is changing dramatically. Look back history of Nokia. We are still in Finland fighting and trying to find who to blame. Was it Ollila? <laughs> was, it, uh, uh, was it Steven Igelop? Or who is the person who killed this fantastic story of uh, mobile phones? It was not killed by anyone. It was killed because our concept, or Nokia's concept, which worked beautifully in 1990s, did not work anymore in a new context we faced in 2000s. And to be honest, I don't believe that even a miracle had been able to save Nokia, because in Europe, it has been impossible to create a context, concept which will meet the requirements of the new context. And now the, the topic, important topic. If you look at the forest industry, forest industry concept has been very simple, scaling and scaling up. That was the, that was the story of forest industry until 2001, or, or early 2000s. And everyone was working with that, and, and that, that was the concept with, which worked nicely with the context. But since that, we have seen dramatic changes. I think that we have all got a lot of evidence that, that the world is different, and the world is not anymore the same. But is our concept concept changed? I have not seen any concept yet. This EU material, fantastic material, there was everything mentioned, but nothing. Because that's not a concept. It's an idea that we should do all kinds of things in order to get results, but that's not a concept. Europe is missing that concept. And I really hope that, uh, that uh, you can provide tools for Europe to create that concept which will work in these circumstances. And finally, what could be the role of Nordic countries, or especially Finland and Sweden? I think we are in a key position, pole position, to make that concept, to assist the European Union to create a reasonable new concept to survive in these circumstances. But it means that we have to be able to decide where the focus is going to be. We cannot do everything. We have to decide mm. what are those sectors where we have to be and we can be best in the world. Mm. I think that Hen Henrik is smiling because Henrik Andrut is saying that material technology is number one and we have to put <laughs> all assets into that. You probably are right. But we have to have that kind of discussion. Not to decide that we want to have everything, because we cannot. We have to decide we want to have those assets which are creating comparative advantage for Nordic, Nordics and for Europe in this mm -hmm. game. And this is a nice game because 
winning opportunities are huge. Hmm. Wind is behind us. And it's much easier to create a good concept, a new concept, when, when that is the case. Thank you, Mr. Ajo. So, Christine, how is Germany adapting the concept to the context? How, how do you see the bioeconomy development, the main barriers in Germany to develop it, and the main opportunities as well? What is the comparative advantage of, of Germany? That's a good, good question. I would start, of course, I like to start with opportunities, not with the barriers, because they, those come anyway. <clears throat> The um, opportunities, I think, is that um, Germany seems to have adopted quite uh, nicely, easily, the concept of renewable energy, as example, or electromobility. I would never expected this, that uh, Germany would be the first country to really try to set up a whole um, an innovative system on energy um, usage, but mm. but it seems that they are doing this now. Uh, we are <laughs> doing this now. I would so really everybody society is is following this up in also, of course politics. So I think this is a very uh, nice way to start um, getting new thinking into economy in in Germany, and and I think this concept can be followed up in this respect. Also, bioenergy, for example, is only a small part. It's not no longer by energy as a whole concept, but it's a small part in this, and this is acceptable also to society, I think. And um, so these are, this is one of the opportunities, or part of the opportunities. The other thing is, uh, in Germany, we have very long have a concept of sustainability and awareness of the need for biodiversity, we are forest lovers, we, hug. <laughs> we don't want to kill it, for, but, but anyway, I mean, on the, on the positive side, it means that we, uh, that the Germany, the concept of uh, sustainability is well known, so you, we just have to uh, widen this concept to the bioeconomy and to the circular bioeconomy. Uh, we are, I think, the best ones to uh, recycle things from the household, so this is a, a very nice concept in which, uh, which we can um, follow up. Um, so what that means is that there is probably a societal demand for novel products. And, and this is something that said before, that I think a driver for the bioeconomy is the demand that comes from the consumer. And I think that is something that Germany can provide. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, that is the same comes to for the barriers, because we are known for um, having uh, angst to start with novel things, so that could, all, of course, also be a barrier if something very disrupt disruptive and a paradigm, a strange of paradigm comes along. But that could be also a barrier in Germany. The, the most important barrier in Germany to buy economy, however, is a good working and a fantastically working chemical industry and automotive mm. industry. Because as soon as long as mm. you have an industry that's working on old concepts, fossil um, raw materials and fossil um, processes, it's very difficult to get a change in this. Mm -hmm. So this is, will be one of the barriers for, um, in, for getting by economy work mm -hmm. in Germany, in my opinion. Thank you, Christine. Mm -hmm. I come back to you, Mr. Parson, in one minute, but I want to jump to uh, Mr. Olikainen, Professor Olikainen, because Christine mentioned the energy issue, the bioenergy. How do you feel about the exciting and intense discussions on the carbon neutrality of bioenergy here in Finland? I, I follow in the media, but also in Brussels, everyone is asking me what is the EFI position. As an economist, how, how do you feel about this discussion? Is it contextualized in the, in the right way? Uh, it's a very difficult question. Um, and as I'm not a natural scientist, it's uh, very, very, very hard to, to decide who is saying what. But we know this much. Uh, scientists disagree about the uh, carbon neutrality of biomass, of used biomass for bioenergy. And the results, the, following the counting rules that are related to the carbon sink, people, people's uh, opinions differ in respect to uh, four issues. One is what we should use as a benchmark. Is benchmark the decarbon that we actually had when we increased the forest harvesting, or should it be what the forest would pro pro produce without harvesting? And people choose different benchmark. The other difference is the time scale. Uh, <clears throat> the carbon uh, depth and the payback time uh, <clears throat> seems to differ a lot from
from a few years to more than 100 or 200 years, depending on how people treat not only the carbon uh, fixed in the trees, but also what happens to carbon in soils. And then calculation methods differ. People <coughs> simply uh, receive different results depending on what sort of calculation methods they use. And then if you contrast these three things to the time horizons that are thought to be relevant for climate policies next 50 years, if you have the payback time that is longer than 50 years, there's an alert sign on, and if it's less, then there is not that much to worry about. I, I feel it, I think that this discussion at least has showed that there are many safe cases where we can increase bio, bio uh, energy use, and there are the few things on which the scientists should get um, an understanding. The problem of this discussion so far has been that the opposing uh, opinions have, been, have not been contrasted in a uh, sophisticated way. And the other problem is that it has been remained at the, uh, how would I say, at natural science level. But if we, if we think about how the forest-based sector works and how the economy and, and, and the prices and costs that drive the solutions, we should be able to look at these things at a broader, uh, broader uh, socioeconomic scale as well to see what actually happens instead of looking just one particular point of the whole, whole chain. So no, no direct answer, <laughs> but points to, to make opinion. Yes. Thank you, Marco. Now the key question for <laughs> Mr. Parson. So we heard Mr. Parson that the EU is planning now the, the revision of the EU bioeconomy strategy. The fact that it is led under DG research also shows that in the past years it has been kept very much in the scientific domain, in the scientific debate. Uh, we see that the bioeconomy bio has clear niches, market niches, but now the challenge is how to bring that as a norm, how to build up political critical mass to bring the bioeconomy to the highest level in the political dimension. What would you do if you were the president of the commission? How to, how to make that happen? You always say that the difficult thing is to do it, you know, not to know, not to know what to do, but to do it. How do we do it? How do we bring the bioeconomy now to the real political debate in an ambitious way? <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> I think it's just to do it because you need to create facts on the ground. If you have this as an ongoing scientific discussion or a political quarrel, uh, you will always have pros and cons. That is a natural uh, situation. And we need that also as an intellectual preparation for a new phase. But uh, someone need to be bold enough to take an initiative to invest in the new. And that is perhaps the traditional forestry industry, or it is the chemical industry, or some else. But someone needs to take an investment decision. And as soon as you can prove that this is good business, I'm convinced there will be many who will follow. But before you have that proof, before you have the proof in the pudding, so to say, um, there will be an ongoing discussion. Uh, you can just listen up on this discussion about carbon uh, sink and, uh, and, and, and bioenergy and uh, so, so. Uh, and you see immediately uh, if you s get stuck there, you will, nothing will happen. So we can talk about it, we can discuss it, but someone has to invest in it. And I don't believe so much in pilot projects. Okay, they are, they are interesting as well. But someone who wants to risk their money need to take the decision. And those who risk their money also then have the right to do some good profits from this. Um, then we have come to a real situation. Um, there is often... Uh, demands that the public sector 
should uh, take the risk. No, we should not do that in the public sector. Uh, we can prepare for the new situation, but when it comes to the final critical decisions, we need to have the private sector on board taking the risks. And uh, so far, I have not seen so much. Perhaps uh, we are, have not been convincing enough. Perhaps we are dealing with wishful thinking in this type of seminars. And perhaps those who are in the real world making the investments are not yet convinced. But someday, someone, somewhere, will take the risk. And then it starts. And those who then will come too late will be punished by history. <laughs> so it is. Thank you, Mr. Parson. Now the, the floor is open for your questions or comments. So, Hendrik, you want to start? So you are ready to invest your money. Uh, simple question. You can choose who among the panelists who answers. Do we need uh, EU uh, bioeconomy strategy? That's really a good, very good question. Who wants to, Mr. Aho? Uh, I, I think we don't. What we need is, uh, Europe should understand that this is ecosystem game. And in that ecosystem game, they should go through all the EU systems and regulations and policies and to, to remove everything what is obstacle for, for making those investments to happen, Jörn Persson was speaking about. I think that is, that is what should be done. Unfortunately, there are still a lot of politicians who believe that, that it is possible to make a big plan and then execute that big plan, and then after five, to ten years, after five or ten years, something is going to be there. It's not like that. But if you have favorable ecosystem, investments are coming to happen, and then results are there. And it means that we have to check our economic systems, our, our technological support systems, our funding systems, uh, R&D funding systems, but also our regulatory environment, so that it will be as favorable as possible for, for bioeconomy. Uh, they can call that strategy, but I, I, I think it's better not to speak about strategy because it leads to an idea that EU can do something. They really don't. Any more reactions, Sofia? You want to compliment? Yes. Um, well, I, I agree in part. Um, even because I, I just talked about the, the different ecosystems, so it goes with, with what you've just said. But I think it's important to have uh, some global guidelines in terms of what, what are the limits of, of of, of, um, of the human activity on bioeconomy. What are the criteria that we can that we should be using when we are dealing with bioeconomy? Exactly the same way as when we are now acting in other sectors. We have different regulations, environmental CO2, and so on. And all of bioeconomy must also fulfill with the COP21 targets and with the sustainable development goals. So I'm in favor of differentiation, and because every country has its own ecosystem. Every country does not have the same speed, and some positive aspect of, of European Union is to raise awareness of specific topics that some countries are more uh, evolved than others, and then the other countries that are not so involved on the topics, they realize that is also an opportunity that they should take into account, and I'm referring to Portugal and to other countries in Europe, uh, of course. But also I think it's important to have some kind of um, framework that uh, identifies what might be the criteria that generally um, the different bioeconomy subsectors must comply with, avoiding extra bureaucracy, avoiding all of that. But if you look at the past, if we don't have some kind of framework, uh, we need to change the mindset of business, and that takes a long time. And then profit maximization comes as a top priority. And when that comes, profit maximization in the short term, when that becomes the main topic, then things might not be sustainable in the long term, and we are all talking about sustainable development. Thank you, Sofia. So now Mr. Parson and then Christine. Uh, Christine, you were... Yeah. Okay. Um, I would say as long as uh, strategy is kind of umbrella, fine, that's good, because what we need is a, a awareness, the raising of awareness for a topic that mm. otherwise lobbyists of other 
um, topics will um, um, overrun. Mm. And uh, second, it, it helps to get this governance uh, topic um, raised. So that's something I would say, yes, we need something. So to have an umbrella, to, to have a, a, a guideline, and also to, um, definitely to raise awareness for the topic. That's mm, thank you. My, my, my point is, I think we already have a bioeconomic strategy. Um, but that is a one, one that ends up in don't use the forests, protect them. And um, uh, if you look upon what the European Union have decided so far about different directives, it's easy to see it ends up there. You need to have something that balance and I am roughly of the same opinion as uh, Professor Lang. Uh, I think we should have one. But, um, uh, and if we don't, if we don't go for it with this broad uh, approach, we will have one nevertheless, but that one will not allow us to use our forests, mm -hmm. de facto. Thank you. We have two questions from the Commission, from, uh, sorry, from Mr. Harmal and then Sari Artioki from the Commission. Uh, thank you. Esco, what you said, has it something to do with so-called precautionary principle? <laughs> Should the European Union visit that? I ask this because to my understanding precautionary principle means that polit policy makers, decision makers should know every possible consequence or non-consequence -co before taking a decision. Very often I have said so, if penicillin penicillinium was invented today, millions of kids would die before the European Parliament would allow it to come to the market because of the precautionary principle. Are we in a blocked situation because of, uh, let's say, somehow overemphasizing that precautionary principle? Yes, please, reaction. Yeah, this is a very, very good point. Uh, I, I will take an example from other sector, healthcare. We know that electronic patient record systems will make a healthcare system much better than what it is today. But, uh, but when we are looking at risks, our risk analysis is not symmetric, but it's asymmetric. Uh, even this week, somebody is dying in Finland because of lack of that kind of system. We don't have that yet. And people are dying because, because uh, of, of uh, physicians do not have access to information they need to, to give the right kind of care. People are dying, but we don't care. We don't really care about that at all. But when new electronic patient record system or part of that was tested once, and one patient died because, because overdosing and, and the system gave wrong indication and, and he, he died, immediately authorities came it became public discussion. Authorities came and, and said, you cannot continue this, this project before you can guarantee that no one will be killed because of this, this uh, new kind of system. So we accept its existing problems, but we don't ac accept any, any risk uh, related to new. And I, I'm, I'm speaking about innovation a lot. Have you heard about an innovation which doesn't include any risk? So how, what, what has been innovated in the world without taking risk? I, I, I cannot imagine any, any, any. And that's why I think this is the typical European Union approach, that we will take into the consideration all the aspects, and that means that we are blocking everything to be changed. We have a huge number of strategies. And have you heard about a strategy which has been executed? No. And that's why my approach is a bit different. I believe that the best way to do, move on is to, to remove obstacles. And that could be probably a much better way to, to get results and also to get companies excited about that. And unfortunately, profit making is the only way to get investments to the sector. So we cannot say that you cannot do good profit, maximum profit. Do as much money as you can. And, and then we will get, get uh, companies uh, to invest in this sector. We have to create that kind of atmosphere. And, uh, and then regulatory process have to take care of that, that there is a balance between different kind of uh, aspects. And, and that, that is where regulator is needed. 
Thank you. Yes, you want to complement on that, and then I will pass to. I think the commission should say something now. <laughs> so. Thank you. My, my name is Sari Artyoki. I'm a commission official and a forest owner, so there are <laughs> this. This is a po possible combination. So I was going to ask you actually before Esa's question is that now that the commission and the EU is will anyways revise the bioeconomy strategy, I would be very interested to hear one point from each of you. What is what is there that you need to see? in this strategy or would the conclusion of today is that we would be better off without a strategy i think it's always a good idea to bear in mind that if there is a strategy work going on about you it's better that you say what you need to see there or then the conclusion the easy way out would be to conclude that we do not need a strategy okay, thank you who would like to start making a point i think you marco yeah uh, I comment actually on strategy and also this Baltic Sea uh, bi uh, bioeconomy action plan. The ac there's a huge difference between the current strategy and the action plan. The action plan forgets everything. It forgets forestry, it forgets climate, it forgets environment. So as a sort of concrete, uh, concrete program for for implementing strategy is, is fa it is failed to my mind. Uh, the strategy itself uh, is much more balanced that, than was this um, bioeconomy action plan. But, but of course, it has a problem of being, how do I say, uh, very loose. Good principles, but but then what actually needs to be done to facilitate the progress? I know it's, it's awfully difficult, but that, that is sort of the level that is missing. It's missing from the EU strat strategy, I think also in the Finnish strategy. Perhaps partly because it's for very difficult to find the simple, direct ways of promoting things, but, but that, that would be my wish. Mm -hmm. Joran, you want to comment? Uh, one size doesn't fit all. Uh, that is the first thing I want to start with. The second thing is to see that uh, we have the right and obligation to use our forest in an industrial process to combat climate change, to make that clear. Mm -hmm. And then how we do it depends on in which part in Europe we live. One mm -hmm. size doesn't fit all. Mm -hmm. Yes. Christine? Very similar conclusion. Um, it has to respect the um, national and regional aspects, but on the other hand, it can help to raise visibility for bioeconomy. And I think if that is uh, achieved, much is achieved. And the third thing is put it into um, integrated with the um, climate uh, topics and integrated with the sustainable development topics and then make it make, make it a part of that. Mm. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Rajo. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think there are a couple of areas where governments can really play a big role and I'd like to concentrate in those. And the uh, two fundamental areas are education. Do we have skills and talents we need mm -hmm. for bio? economy. Mm -hmm. I, I think no. We have, to, we have to improve the situation and, and that is an area where mm -hmm. EU can play a role mm -hmm. and governments can play a role. Second area is, is uh, fundamental research and, uh, and focused efforts in, in that area to, to those areas where mm -hmm. we really do have capacity to become the best in the world and to create comparative advantage in, in, in Europe. Uh, Henrik will say again material <laughs> technology. Thank you. Before I pass the word to Sofia, uh, just to say goodbye to Mr. Parson. He needs to take a plane, but uh, an applause for his contribution. Thank you. Back to your forest, Joran. <laughs> so, Sofia, please continue. Well, I, I agree with what, what was said here in the table in relation with the European bioeconomy strategy. And I would add eventually also the need to recognize the ecosystem services that m might mm -hmm. also be considered yeah. as part of the bioeconomy yes. in a clear way. Yes. 
So be very clear about what are the ecosystem mm. services that are, can be considered as part of the yes. bioeconomy. Somehow includes the needs to um, throughout the process or when countries and companies are analyzing the options to al actually also uh, evaluate economically the economic value of the ecosystems that are being destroyed or created out of that technology or out of that process. And I completely agree with Christina in the sense that include this uh, and relate the strategy also with the sustainable development goals from the United Nations mm. because each country will have to comply or at least will have to provide information about how each country is, mm. is, is contributing to the sustainable development goals. This will reach each individual company as well. And in this case, it makes complete sense to also include mm -hmm. the perspective of the bioeconomy, including the perspective of the targets and the goals of the sustainable development goals. Thank you, Sofia. Questions? Comments, questions? I come to you, Hendrik, soon. But there are two questions there at the end. I see one from Germany. Yes. Hello, my name is Thomas Hausmann from the Ministry of, of Agriculture in Germany. Um, I would like to come back from the political level, maybe to forest management. And my point here is uh, the enlargement of the raw material basis, so increasing of the timber production. Um, because, uh, of course, you might need additional timber if you want to implement um, these kind of strategies. And of course, there are different possibilities to increase uh, this production. Uh, one would be to a forest uh, uh, additional land to increase the forest area. In Germany, we have a big debate to put even more forest set aside to have wilderness area, 2% of our German forest. So the tendency is going in a different way. You could, of course, argue that uh, the conversion of conifer uh, stands uh, to broadleaves should be uh, uh, changed again. This is not very popular, I, I believe, in our society. Mm. You could uh, argue that you should reduce the age of the tree before cutting it. This is also not very popular because we want to increase our deadwood. Uh, we would like to have thick trees. Um, you could, of course, also discuss about invasive species replacing those uh, native uh, species which uh, are affected by uh, invasive uh, fungi or insects like the ash dieback in Germany, the elm of course is well known. So all these are points mm -hmm. which might be difficult to implement um, the strategy to get even more raw material. And I would be interested to know if this is a dis discussion also in other countries, Finland, Sweden, uh, and what are your uh, reactions on this, also from the research point? Thank mm -hmm. you. Maybe my colleague? Or yes, should I stop here? let's take another one. Yeah, good idea. Let's take another one. Um, yeah, hello. My name is Tilman Schatze from the Agricultural Ministry in Germany as well. Um, and maybe my comment um, and question goes more to the, towards the direction what we have been talking about now before, if we need or not a European bioeconomy strategy. And I was quite surprised actually that first of all the question was uh, came up because I think of course we need one and then I was surprised of the answers as well. Um, I don't think the question is if we need one or not because um, rather a strategy also shows a willingness to do something and if on a European level we want to implement the bioeconomy and I think all in the room here we are clear with that we want to do that then of course you have to formulate that somewhere. And I'm a little bit, now speaking maybe a little bit uh, from my heart, I'm sick and tired of this discussion of regionality. Of course, regionality is important. And we know um, that the bioeconomy here will be different than what a bioeconomy in Germany looks like. But it's the same with the fossil economy. I mean, where's the difference? Um, even in Germany, we have our national policy strategy, and that is being implemented in different ways on a, on a regional level, but why not? So, from my point of view, we need a European bioeconomy strategy, of course. One size doesn't fit all, but it depends on what level you, you are at. If you um, set out the, yeah, where you want to reach, and 
more or less come up with valid principles for whole Europe, that is something we can work with and done on a national level that can be implemented. Mm -hmm. um, even if that means taking or reducing boundaries, for example, to, to implement things or for, for investment, that's a strategy too, already. So um, I think we should have a national, uh, we should have a European bioeconomy strategy um, as well to, to make clear what we are talking about. When we saw the presentations here, I noticed that there's a strong mixture between, or uh, a tendency to mix bioeconomy and circular economy. And on the European level, I saw that, I, uh, I noticed that too. From a German point of view, circular and bioeconomy are two different concepts. They are strongly interlinked, but still it's two different things. Um, so I think we should rather focus a little bit on if everybody wants to find himself in the European bioeconomy strategy, how and where can we put the input? So my question doesn't go that much to, to the panel, but rather to the commission. How and where can the member states and as well the stakeholders uh, yeah, influence and deliver input to the revision of the bioeconomy strategy, which is, still, uh, which is already ongoing now? Thank you. Thank you. You make a very clear comment. Uh, while the commission is thinking if there is an answer for that question, can you allow the answer to the concern by Thomas? Do we have enough wood in Europe to meet the increasing, the supposed increasing demands? And I want to link your question, Thomas, with a speech of Commissioner Bella two weeks ago in Brussels, where he mentioned that there will be a, an, an, a demand increase of 40% of wood in the next 15, 20 years. Is that the case, Lauri? You are one of the best experts in the market. Thank you. So I'm Lauri Hetemäki, Assistant Director of uh, EFI. There was 2010 a study called EU Wood Study, uh, basically saying that if we have this 2020 uh, policy uh, increasing, for example, biomass based bioenergy, we will come to a situation where uh, in EU countries the demand for forest biomass will increase 70% from 2020 to 2030. Uh, if you look at that study more closely and you look at what, what is actually happening in the market, since 2007 the industrial roundwood production in the EU has been declining. That is because of the uh, uh, economic downturn, but it's also because of structural things. So I, I guess my first uh, comment is that we really need to reassess about uh, the biomass demand that will be there for 2030, especially with the new policies. Nobody really knows what it will be. And I would caution about uh, thinking that there will be a huge increase in the numbers. I, I give another example. 20th century forest-based bioeconomy was two. By two, I mean it was basically pulp and paper industry and wood products industry. When you talk about this century, uh, biomass, forest biomass based uh, uh, bioeconomy. It's, the key word is diversification. We have heard today about Anekoski, which will produce 1.3 million tons of pulp. Two weeks ago, I visited Borregord, uh, a Norwegian pulp mill, which is just thinking of doubling its nanopulp production from 5,000 to 10,000 tons. The scale is completely different. Diversification means that for somebody, the bioeconomy means very high value products like vanilla for, for Boracord. For others, it means scaling up the production. So the diversification is the key word. Some of the products will need more wood, some will not. They will need less than in the past. What is the net effect? Nobody really knows. Thank you. Thank you, Lauri. Henrik has a question, but does the Commission have an answer? <laughs> you? Thank you. Maybe uh, just one or two sentences. There's a whole process and there's a whole calendar about reviewing the bioeconomy uh, strategy, and you find this actually in the PDF of my presentation, which we will make available to everybody. Uh, because I didn't so much uh, insist on the, the details. 
Uh, there has been in Utrecht uh, a conference by Economy Stakeholder Conference. They've produced a, a manifesto, which is an ongoing process. There will be an expert group meeting uh, later in the autumn. Uh, there is uh, under the Slovak presidency uh, another bioeconomy uh, conference. So it's a whole process which will go on this whole year and also into the next year. And there are plenty of opportunities to provide uh, input. And of course, it is clear that uh, the next bioeconomy strategy is uh, meant to be, just to use maybe a modern word, co-created together with uh, the stakeholders. So uh, it's of course the internal uh, services, uh, the different commission departments, they have a role to provide uh, input. It's uh, the member states through different, uh, through the SCAR, through uh, GPIs, through ERANET, through uh, the program committee, it's input and ideas which come from the uh, BBI, from uh, uh, the advisory groups. Let's say if you look from the regions, uh, we get knowledge from the JRC, the Bioeconomy Observatory. There's a whole ecosystem of mm -hmm. bioeconomy governance, which is not only European, it's also national, it's regional, and they all are engaged in this co-creation process. Thanks. Thank you for the answer. Last question, and then we need to go to the concluding remarks. If anyone wants to get it, Henrik, you want to have the last question? Henrik, you, you can put them later. Uh, thank you for uh, putting forward a question. Um, my name is Mr. Falk. I'm running a business network with SMEs in the southwest of Sweden. Uh, we heard Mr. Persson mentioning about investments in bioeconomy with or without a new or an old uh, bioeconomic strategy. My question is, I can't even uh, encourage uh, SMEs to buy an, a new car who's not run on petrol or diesel because there is no long-term decisions made by politicians what will be the taxes and so forth two or three years ahead. There might be an election coming up and so on. So asking for any big investments within bioeconomy with millions of euros without any long-term decisions is to me sitting back home and wish for improvements. Mm. Uh, my question was primarily to Mr. Person, but I also would like to address it to, to Santos and your economic point of mm -hmm. view. Could we have an even better cooperation in between private and public sectors in the European Union? Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Oh, that's a tough question. Mm -hmm. But yes, you're right. Um, I think, I mean, not... Even if, you, if, if for some seconds we, we, we go away from the bioeconomy, generally the existing tax system is a problem for, for companies because we really don't know generally what might the taxes be in the next one, two years. Countries changes in European rules are not so clear and suddenly a particular issue comes up and the tax system changes. So I, I completely agree with you. I think it's Everything that is related with the, with the green economy and then in particular with bioeconomy, we there are no clear indications about um, the, type of, the type of tax incentives, if, even because when we come and we start talking about tax incentives, then the other thing that comes immediately is the competitiveness, even in relation with the other sectors. And if actually European Union um, um, wants or is willing to have specific tax, allow for specific uh, uh, tax, ta um, tasks, uh, fiscal systems in different countries, because by doing that, it's indirectly uh, making some countries growing faster than others, and is that a political issue? Is that just leave it for the market. So there is this philosophical approaches as well, and that are related with the way we see um, the economic development of countries. But I, I completely agree with you, and, and I would say that uh, yes, I think throughout the, all of this topic of green economy and bioeconomy, the, there is a strong linkage between companies, government, and and, and financial system. And these three, they have different goals, different targets in terms of what they are made for. Uh, but the general outcome for the next economic model that is, is about to, to emerge, these three need to be need to talk because uh, most of the mainstream banking, uh, either you go there and you have lots of assets and therefore you are not risky, they will lend you money, but otherwise the bioeconomy models are 
might be a bit difficult for the mainstream banking to understand what the risk and the opportunities are. It's a different language. So they also need to have their risk some kind minimized, some, in a way minimized. And, by, and, and also the public money, okay, we might need some public incentive also for that, for, so that the private sector comes in with more money and then the banking sector goes in. So basically I agree with you in the sense that we need to have a stronger conversation between the players and definitely put the financial sector on the spot because without the money, without the flow, if the flowing, if the flow of money doesn't go on, is not aligned with this type of topics, then uh, either we only go for private, for public money, which we seen that eventually is not the best opportunity or the private sector also needs to take a risk, but the money needs to to be aligned with this type of goals, and it has been difficult to align the money with these goals, and, and that's another challenge. I was not able to respond very directly to your question, but that's as, as best as I can. <laughs> Thank you, Sofia. Now, Mr. Rajo, you can move to the concluded, concluding remarks. Yeah, I think it's time to, to conclude now, because wine is waiting for us. And is, is it bioproduct? <laughs> Yes, it is. So, so we can start, start enjoying bioeconomy in a very concrete way quite soon. But before that, you have to listen for a while my, my concluding remarks. What was the last big success, uh, industrial success story in Europe? Where Europe took the lead in the world for a while and was doing huge good business, improving mobile telephones. Do you remember, did we have mobile technology strategy of the European Union? No, we didn't. But we did many good strategic decisions in Europe. GSM standard adopted in Copenhagen 1987 played a huge role in, in creating business opportunities. And it was public-private effort. Standardization, regulatory environment, which, which was very critical. R&D spending. Europe was investing in this sector heavily, long period of time, and that helped companies to, to, to become world class in, in this sector. Education. We trained people who had capacities needed for mobile technology. And then finally, we opened the market for competition. We made it possible that companies made money when investing in this sector. I was in the Parliament of Finland when, when that decision was made, 1986. And it was one of the best decisions ever made in the, in the Finnish Parliament, but we did not know what we were doing. Because we didn't believe that, we expected that this is going to create competition between fixed line, fixed line companies. But we actually made a huge hole in the system and uh, mobile technology was able to come through thanks to that decision. And Finland was, by the way, second in Europe after the UK, roughly in the same time with, uh, with Sweden. I, I took this example only to introduce what should we do in order to get something to be done. Not to make plans, but open opportunities and to make these opportunities profitable for all, so that there are good incentives for all to work for, for these purposes. This is a very good start, start for, for, for that, I, I believe, that this type of event. Secondly, have you ever heard about ODA loop, O-O-D-A loop? That is a strategy, a, a military strategy used in, during the Korean War in 1950s. And what these letters O-O-D-A means? O, first O, observe. Second O, Orient. D, decide. And A, act. If you want to survive as a military pilot in a, in a, in a struggle or in, 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 in a fighting, you have to use this order loop. I think that is a good advice for us as well when we want to get this uh, bioeconomy really go forward and, and, and to be uh, to be executed in, in Europe. We need this ODA loop. And observations are there. I think we are, we have made a lot of observations today, and we all agree very roughly that what the fundamentals are, what the context is, is going to be. Secondly, uh, orientation. 
I think we have already orientation as well. So we know that this is the direction we have to go. But now we have two missing links, decide. And uh, I think this discussion was very good about decision making. It doesn't mean that somebody is going to do one single decision, or, but we need huge number of good decisions in order to get things to be done. A strategic decisions, maybe without strategy. And then act. And this is the fundamental problem in Europe. If we want to do something to be done, we have to be able to act. And uh, I think we are far away from, from that. That's why I, I think this EFI initiative to, to have this kind of, this kind of uh, forum or event is, is, uh, is very, very important. And, uh, and, uh, and it's very important that EFI has decided to take this type of, this type of broader role, not only to look at forests and future of forests, but to look at the bioeconomy bio -economy as, as a whole. Thank you so much for, for today's uh, speakers. Jöran Persson left already for fighting for better prices for wood products in, in Sweden and especially raw material in, in Sweden. That is what social democrats are doing nowadays in, in Europe. And, uh, and, um, and all others who have been speaking here today. And especially thank you for all the participants who have made this, this event uh, a success. And uh, Mark, uh, thank you also for EFI team who has organized this, this event. Now we have, I think we have deserved uh, bioproducts, yes. but not unlimited. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one minute, because it's not over, the party. Uh, since the wine and the aperitif are sponsored by Forbio Project, which is a project coordinated by the Eastern Finland University, I would like to invite the coordinator of Forbio to explain us what is Forbio doing and which wine is in the list. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be here on the behalf of Forbio Project and I would like to say that no drinks are three, so ne you need to listen to me two minutes. And Forbio, what does it mean? It's a strategic research project funded by Academy of Finland. And what we do with the Forbio Project, it is that we try or we will provide for decision making smart, science-based means and support also novel tools to help to enhance in sustainable way to move to, towards resource efficient and climate neutral forest based bioeconomy. A lot of promises, by the way. And how we do this? So we have committed to this project a number of key stakeholders in Finland who represent key ministries and also forest bioeconomy actors and we collaborate with them frequently. And this event today is part of the process in that way that EFI, Lauri Hetemäki, is leading one of the work packages which really is dealing with this policy support matters. And finally, I would like to say that the Finnish government has also put a lot of efforts to support policy making also in bioeconomy and there is a many strategic research uh, spearhead project ongoing related to this topic. So thanks for the government for that also. So in addition to Vorpio, we have a lot of efforts ongoing. And now I think it's time for the fine and not made by food, I think so. Thank you very much.